Hello, 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 my friends. Jill Osborne from the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, September 19th. I love September. I love the fall. We are so ready to let the heat of summer go, aren't we? Am I right? Let me get everything set up here. Hi, Debbie. Nice to see you, hun. Nice to see you. Let me just switch this over here. Hello, Caroline from Dagenham, England. How are you today? Actually, it's nighttime for you, right? What time is it for you, Caroline? Um, well, we're going into another fire alert tonight at uh, 8 or 9 o'clock. Uh, they're expecting high winds for 24 hours. So, you know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, in a month, you're going to see I'm going to be dragging. Oh, it's really nice to see you, Debbie. All right. I don't know what's going on with YouTube here. Normally, we simulcast on YouTube and, and Facebook, but uh, YouTube is being weird. They do not understand why. Hi, Linda. Nice to see you, hon. Hmm. Well, you know what I might do, since it looks like we're having a little, some issues with YouTube. Um, yeah, look at that. Just got an emergency alert. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, okay, maybe YouTube's working. Hi, guys. Hello, hello. I think that we're all kind of running on empty right now. Hi, Jane. Nice to see you, hon. Very, 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 very nice to see you. Hello, YouTube. Nice to see you, too. We just have one, one, one person on YouTube right now. YouTube's going pretty slow, but that's okay. So let me introduce myself. My name is Jill Osborne. I'm the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. I'm the longest serving IC support group leader in the United States. And right now, I think it's pretty fair to say close to being in the world. I think Germany might be ahead. Um, uh, my purpose in doing these meetings is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, so informed that no one can mess with you again. I don't want anybody to be able to affect your self-esteem or minimize you or diminish you. I see it's absolutely real. Uh, hello, Peony. Nice to see you. Uh, and it is treatable. It is treatable. And so, you know, but we've learned a lot. We've, we've learned so much now in the last couple of years. We've learned about vari variants and subtypes of IC that not everybody's the same. For some people, IC begins in childhood. For others, IC begins after menopause. They're both diagnosed with IC, but are they the same? They're not the same. For some people, IC begins after chemotherapy. Well, for others, IC begins after falling down their tailbone. They both have the di same diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, but are they the same? No, they are not the same. They are not the same. And something rather remarkable happened earlier this year when some of the top IC doctors in the country finally admitted that, yes, you can't put apples, oranges, and bananas in the same research study. Now we know why research studies have failed. Because you can't mix all these different types of patients together. So we, we're now doing something called subtyping, where we're really trying to understand your unique presentation of IC. The word IC at this point in time doesn't mean much. What it means is that you've got frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, but it doesn't give us any inclination as to why you might be having that, right? We just don't. Anne says, so at first, does estrogen burn? Yes, it does. Absolutely. That burning sensation that you get with estrogen is just uh, uh, telling you how dry your skin is. If your skin were really healthy and had a nice thick coating of mucus, you'd be good. The estrogen should not burn. But the fact is, is that you're probably quite dry, as many of us get. And that dryness then allows the, the chemicals to kind of reach into your bladder and cause, a, I mean, reach into the skin and cause of a bit of a, a burning sensation. But what you're going to find is that burning is going to diminish fairly quickly. I mean, you, it took about mm, 10 days, three, four applications for it to go away from me completely. If I don't use my estrogen for a week or two, the burning comes right back because my skin has gotten drier again. Right. It's very interesting. You know, and it's it's I think one of the 
one of the things that I just consistently see over and over and over again is that doctors don't take the time to explain to you kind of these subtle things that can happen. Thus, if you go and you have your pelvic floor assessment and it hurts, you know, and it's like, I'm not going back there. It hurts. They don't tell you that the whole point of having your pelvic floor assessed is to try to touch muscles to see if you can trigger pain. And if you trigger pain, hey, man, that's your hallelujah moment. That means they found it. And the same is true with estrogen. The fact is, is that when you use a little bit of topical estrogen cream and you're dry, it's going to burn at first. But your skin is going to immediately start using that estrogen to produce a, a better skin, a nice, thick coating of mucus. Um, Peony says, my pain is to the right of my bladder, but at time affects my bladder greatly. I located a spot with my pelvic wand to the right of my cervix. That's very painful. Isn't that interesting? That's really, really interesting. And so what do I always say to patients is if you have a spot, if your pain is always located in one unique place, like to the right of your cervix, then we need to get your doctor to look at that, the structures there, right? And so you have, uh, you know, Peony, I just, I did a blog a couple of weeks ago about a woman who had a torn ligament. And, and it would, it was literally to the side of her cervix. And what happened then is her vagina rotated. And so it's facing backwards. And yeah, she says, yes, every time it hurts every time. Uh, so her vagina had rotated the other way. And so when they repaired that ligament and re-rotated her vagina back in the right position, her pain went away. And so that would be one thing we would look at. I think that's called posterior fornix syndrome, posterior, posterior fornix syndrome. So you need to point that out to your gynecologist. The other thing is, could it be a, a spot of endometriosis or could it be a little bit of scar tissue? Oh, well, look at this, guys. Peony says, yes, my uterus flipped recently. There you go. There you go, hun. So what they can do is they can put an, um, a wooden, uh, uh, I always forget what you call it, not a speculum, you know, it's just a, 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 a little tiny piece of, of, you know, a flat with tongue depressor, only it's, it's wooden and it's used in the vagina, right? They can put that up there and, and they would put it to the right of the cervix. And if by putting it to the right of the cervix, resolve some of your pain and discomfort, then we know that that's the issue. So go on over to our website, Peony, icnetwork at mac.com. And please, please, please read that blog because your uterus flipping is not normal, my friends. Hi, angels. Nice to see you. Anne says, so if you have a flare, does it happen immediately or the next day or so? Um, and it depends upon the type of flare. Um, so if, for example, you had sex, uh, most women will experience their flare with intimacy a, um, a couple of hours after sex, five, six, seven hours after sex. Whereas if you have hunter's lesions and you drank um, a really strong green tea, which would be very, very irritating, you would probably feel that flare as soon as that green tea hit your bladder 45 minutes to an hour, right? And for anybody who's new, who's watching, if you go on over to our website, which is icnetwork.org, icnetwork.org, um, uh, and sign up for our free mailing list, you can get our, our flare management guide and it's free. It's just our gift to you. And I, and, and believe me, I, I do not send out spam. I do not sell those mailing lists off to anyone. I keep very, very tight control over everything because I respect your privacy. Caroline says, tried to get some estrogen cream for estrogen atrophy, but the doc said no because of blood clots in my family. E okay, so Caroline, that puts you in a very difficult, a, a difficult position. So in your case, then, since you can't use estrogen, um, you're, uh, and I would do a little bit of reading up on that too, just to be, you know, just so that you really understand the correlation between blood clots and estrogen. I'm really not sure what that is. Um, um, and I, I don't know enough about that to make a comment on that. What I can tell you, though, is that your next step is going to be either doing something like coconut oil on the outside, on your vulva, on your perineum, 
or something like the magic. And I have it here. The magic is the closest I've ever seen to delivering um, a, um, moisture to the vulva that mimics the normal moisture we would see on there. So V magic is a very simple, it looks like Vaseline, but it doesn't feel like Vaseline at all. It's a very, 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 very light. And it, and it really closely mimics the natural mucus you would find down there. They say the thing is, is the drier you get, what's going to happen is when you urinate and urine crosses that dry vulva, it's going to burn. We call that urine burn. That skin needs a little bit of protection. Um, and that's where V magic or uh, uh, coconut oil would be reasonable. I'm going to sneeze. <gasps> Hold on. <gasps> Excuse me. So Anne says, is estrogen safe? Uh, Anne, um, I would encourage you to Google uh, estrogen safety. I, but this is what I know. This is what I know from the research and from following many, many doctors. Uh, topical, uh, topical estrogen, that means an estrogen cream that you put on your skin is considered remarkably safe because it does not pass to any great degree through the skin into your bloodstream where it's going to circulate throughout your body, where it could potentially link to breast cancer. Topical estrogen does not travel to any great degree. So topical estrogen is considered remarkably safe. In contrast to an estrogen patch, let's say you have an estrogen patch that you put on your arm. Now that's relying on your bloodstream to distribute it throughout your body. That's going to be absorbed through your arm. I mean, through your skin into your blood vessels where it's going to be distributed. And the same is true when you take it when you take it orally. Oral estrogen is considered the riskiest. So when I started taking, so I started taking oral estrogen when I was like 50 or 51. And I was dealing with a lot of muscle spasms, just really, really, I mean, that's my, my issue from day one. It's just muscle, 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 muscle. And the muscle spasms got that much worse. And, um, and, and menopause can actually trigger more muscle tension. So my mother had taken estrogen for decades, no problem. So I thought, okay, I don't carry a risk, of, a genetic risk of estrogen. So I'm going to give it a try. I loved it. I love taking oral estrogen. I mean, my memory was better. I, my skin was better until about three years later when I started spotting and it was like pink lemonade, like little tiny pink lemonade spotting uh, on my on my underwear, on my mini pad. And that got worse and that got worse. And then I started, it took about four months before I was, I was passing big blood clots. And anyway, to make a very long story short, what the estrogen had done is it had triggered an excessive growth in my endometrium. Um, as well as the development of, um, uh, what do you call them? Polyps. I had a big giant polyp that was bleeding right in the middle of my, of my uterus. Um, and, um, and that's, and then I had, um, atypical, uh, cells, endometrial cells. And it's the atypical endometrial cells that are associated with uterine cancer. And so, um, for those of you who've been my fans and been following for years, y'all know I ended up having an emergency hysterectomy because they thought I had um, uh, severe cancer in my uterus. It turned out what I had was something called um, comple complex endometrial hyperplasia with atypia. So I had the atypical precancer cells, but the biopsy also showed that they were starting to build something like tumors. And that's why I ended up having the hysterectomy. So I, do I regret taking the oral estrogen? Um, damn it. I just wish that I'd been able to tolerate it. Well, um, I do because I, I loved how I felt on it. I really did. But, um, I don't take any estrogen oral estrogen now. I just, which is why my face is falling. Right. You, you age 10 years in the first year after you stop your estrogen. But you got, you got to have a talk with your doctor about it. There are risks. I did ask the doctor. It's like, why did this happen to me? My mother's taking it. 
I mean, I didn't, I don't have the genetics. And, and he said, you know, it's not really about genetics. It's about, do you have cells that get turned on by estrogen? And the answer is partyville. Yes, I do have cells that got turned on by estrogen, but there's a big, and I'm still dealing with it. There's this big emotional thing that happens when you have a hysterectomy and you, and you completely lose your ability to have children. There's a real deep grief um, that uh, I still struggle with four years later, along with pelvic floor spasms and dryness. As I'm sitting here right now, I'm feeling that pulling sensation on my levator muscles, which is what happened after my, my hysterectomy also. Melody says, hi, Jill, been flaring for weeks, was in the hospital a month ago with pyelonephritis. Oh, girl, I'm so sorry. Jo uh, Loretta, uh, also known as John, uh, says, see, I remembered your name, didn't I? I remembered your name. Uh, can you use vaginal estrogen when you're diagnosed with estrogen positive breast cancer? And that's a discussion you've got to have with your doctor. Some doctors would say yes, and some doctors would say no. I think it depends upon the type of uh, breast cancer you had and how aggressive it was. Ancest, does a flare happen immediately or the next day or weeks? The flares don't normally happen weeks later. Flares normally happen within at least within 24 hours of some sort of event triggering it. Jadronka, hello, Jadronka. Can you, uh, would you like my email? It's super easy. I see network at Mac, short for Macintosh computer. So M as in Mary, A as in Apple, C as in Charlie.com. I see network at Mac.com. Ashley says, thank you for running these. I really need it. Oh, honey, you're so welcome. I mean, listen, <sighs> life is weird. And, you know, I, I think we all go through those. It's not necessarily a why me moment. It's more of a why did this happen? Why is my life the way it is? I'm not where I want to be. I thought I'd be doing different things. And, and which is I find myself going into frequently. Um, and I, I was doing it this morning quite a bit. And last night, it's like, I wanted five children. I wanted a lot of grandchildren and it didn't happen. And, you know, there's a, we can really torture ourselves thinking about those things. And I, I always just have to say to myself, I, there are two things I say to myself. Number one, Jill, you're not alone. You have got thousands, tens of thousands of brothers and sisters with IC. Uh, hello, hello, everybody in here, because you are my brother and sister with IC. And, and I truly believe that we, we are all put here for a specific reason, a specific. And so I, I, all I can say to myself is you were meant to be where you are right now. So that is where you are. You are meant to be here. And then I remember my guardian angels. I do believe in guardian angels. So I always have guardian angels sitting back here. One of which is Grandma Jenny. Which, if you saw me in the morning without makeup on, I am a twin. She and our twins. It's hysterical. I should get a I should get a picture of her so you could see her. My last picture of her is when she was like 96. And we have the same cheekbones, everything. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be Grandma Jenny in 20 years. Kayleen says, happy Sunday. Happy Sunday to you. Hi, Cindy. Janet says, I've been off Almeron for three years, but in the last year, I've been experiencing pain on the left side of my pelvis. I went to see my urologist. He did a cystoscopy and gave me an icy treatment. The next night, I had the worst flare in years. Was prescribed peridium that irritated my bladder. They did find a polyp growth in my bladder that they want to biopsy. I'm freaked out because if it's a simple cystoscopy, I'm freaked out because if a simple cystoscopy can cause a flare, what can a biopsy do? <sighs> well, again, so again, Janet, anytime a patient can point to a specific location that's triggering their pain and discomfort, we have to try to understand what's happening there. So, so could you have a hunter's lesion there? Could you have um, a polyp there. Could you have a stitch perforating your bladder in that spot from a previous surgery? There could be something there that they could work on and resolve. And so I don't think, 
I, you know, I, I don't believe in guessing. I like facts. I think it's very, very important to let somebody to look at that area. If you don't allow somebody to look, then you're forcing them to guess. And frankly, I think you deserve more than a guess, just like I think I deserve more than a guess. So in this case, they did a cystoscopy. They looked in your bladder. They found a, they found a polyp. Polyps are not normal in the bladder. I, I, I do think that what your doctor is requesting you to agree to is reasonable. If it were me, I would probably, as somebody who had a giant polyp, and polyps are known for, at least the uterine polyps are known for bleeding, um, uh, I would probably want to get that polyp biopsy. I would probably want it removed and get a biopsy. You know, and the thing is, girl, I mean, now listen, yeah. So the cystoscopy, the normal thing that hurts after the cystoscopy is a urethra. The bladder normally is not injured when you have a normal routine cystoscopy. It's just the instrument pushing through your urethra that can cause more irritation. And so, you know, your question is, is are you going to have a flare if they remove it? And the answer is, well, they'll probably do a little bit of cauterization right there just to kind of close that hole for lack of a better time. Could it hurt a little bit? Yeah, it might. Uh, I, I, if I were you, I would be following the diet afterwards and I would be really insisting on, if not demanding, pain care. Like, I think that would be my, this, now, now guys, you got to remember, you got to remember that I'm not here to give you medical advice. It is not my job to give you medical advice. It's not my job to push you away from your doctors. It is my job to bring you closer to your doctors and to encourage discussions about various things. And so, Jana, what I would do is what I would say to the doctor is, all right, I understand. You want to look at it? I'm curious now. I'd like to know, too. Um, but I'm also very, very worried about pain. So will you agree to give me some pain medicine for a week or so afterwards so that if I do have a flare, I will have relief for that? And if the doctor says, not a problem, yeah, we'll give you some Norco, you're good to go. If the doctor says, oh, you'll be fine, you won't need pain meds, your answer is going to be, doc, the cystoscopy had me in bed for four days afterwards. So I don't know about you, but this is my direct experience. I'm going to need help. Are you willing to give me help? And if he says no, then I would say, all right, then can you, uh, I think what I would like to do is I would like to get a second opinion with another doctor. I mean, I, I personally would never agree to a major procedure without an assurance and a prescription in my hand for pain meds, which is actually what I, I demanded for my hysterectomy. And for my um, DNC, I mean, I just, I flat out said, I won't do it without pain care. And he goes, not a problem. We'll give you meds that day. I went, I, 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 that's not good enough for me. I need a prescription right now. I want it filled and next to my bed so that when I come home, I will be in pain. I will be good. And he's like, chill, not a problem. And they wrote me out a prescription for a little bit of Norco. I see it. You know, that's a gift of being a little bit older too is, is we get to be a little bit more firm. Mm. Angel says, I had endometriosis to the fourth stage. It is very deep. I'm still dealing with it. Plus I had a baby and I don't know what would happen to him. What happened to him? I do know that much that I was young. Mm, honey, Angel, I'd love to talk with you. If you want to give me a phone call this week, I'd be happy to go through some stuff with you. Maybe we can come up with a few questions that would help you. Uh, what advice do I have for somebody going through menopause? <laughs> it is a roller coaster. It is a roller coaster. It is so freaky. So when you think about, think about teenagers that are going through puberty and how emo they are, Okay, well, menopause is reverse puberty. You're going to be emo. You're going to have periods where you're going to cry. You're going to have periods when you're going to rage. Uh, you're going to have periods where, you know, you, the, I mean, when you actually have your period, they're going to get more, ran they're going to get shorter and they're going to get uh, uh, more frequent. So instead of every 28 days, it might be every 21 days. 
And you kind of have to be honest and warn your family. I mean, seriously, I went through a period where I had the rages, um, where like literally I wanted to slug the next person I saw. It didn't matter who it was. Could have been a family member. I just had this deep, profound anger. And 15 minutes later, it'd be gone. And I, I asked myself, what am I angry about? I had no idea what I was angry about. And when I talked to my gynecologist about it, she, he went, Jill, don't you know that's the rages? That's a hormone swing it's fine. It's normal. You're going to be fine. Just ride through it and don't hit anybody. And I never did hit anybody. And that doesn't happen anymore. Now other things are happening because now we don't have estrogen. So there's a really good book called uh, The Menopause Manifesto. Let's see if I have it here. Uh, here it is. The Menopause Manifesto by Dr. Jen Gunter is going to answer all of your questions about menopause. <laughs> it's so weird. Life is weird. So you guys, we are simulcasting live. So when I'm looking over here, I'm looking at YouTube. When I'm looking over here, I'm looking at Facebook. And y'all are both asking questions. So. All right, let's go back to Facebook here. Is Slippery M good to use? Yeah, if it works for you, go for it. If it doesn't cause a flare, I mean, I don't, I, you know, Slippery M has been one of those herbs that have been discussed, uh, you know, not in a, any formal way, any, any research-based way, but um, I do know that this book, I should just take this down. Where is it? So the first book that was written that really talked about herbs and herbal strategy and alternative strategies in depth is this book called I See Naturally. I See Naturally by Diana Brady. And Diana Brady was a support group leader, I think, in North Carolina. And then she, like me, split off from the ICA and, and started doing her own thing. And one of the things she did is this really fantastic book. Uh, you can still get this book on uh, Amazon. Her husband is selling it now. She unfortunately passed away from cancer about five or six years ago. Um, so I know that she talks about Slippery Elm in here. Um, I just don't know exactly where. So I See Naturally by Diana Brady would be a book you could refer to. Loretta says, ductal carcinoma, calcium driven left breast, 99% estrogen driven, postmenopausal calcification, worried about my bladder and vaginal atrophy. Well, you know, again, I think that's something that you're going to have to talk to your doctor about. I, you know, so after my scare and um, my skin, you know, obviously is really, really dry now, which sucks totally. Um, I had another doctor say I should go back on oral estrogen. It's like, Jill, you, you don't have a uterus anymore. You don't have to worry about uterine cancer. And I said, well, what about breast cancer? And he was just very glib about it. He's like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. Just go back on the estrogen. So then I went back to my regular gynecologist and I said, so Dr. So-and-so says that I can go back on estrogen. What do you think about that? Do I carry a risk of developing breast cancer? And the answer is, yeah. There, what she said is that there, there's a small group of women who get both uterine cancer and breast cancer. Even though we have absolutely zero history of that in my family, zero, zero, which is why I thought it was safe to take estrogen in the first place. Uh, but leave it to me to be the, uh, you know, innovative one. Um, I say facetiously. Uh, so, Loretta, you know what I would do is I would Google. Well, you know what? Let me just do it. Hold on a sec. Let, let me just do it myself. What I was going to Google is topical estrogen safety uh, uh, with a previous breast cancer. <sighs> 
Oh, okay, here you go. So this is from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, and this is a the use of vaginal estrogen in women with a history of estrogen-dependent breast cancer published in March of 2016. This is a committee opinion. Um, and this is a committee of the American College of OBGYN. Uh, Let's see here. Hold on. Am I? All right. So what? So what the American College of OBGYN says is that they want you to first do non-hormonal approaches as first-line steps for managing urogenital symptoms or an atrophy related to estrogen atrophy. Um, however, if you're not responding to first line therapies, then they say that va that vaginal estrogen should be tried. The decision to use vaginal estrogen may be in coordination with a women's oncologist. Um, data does not show an increased risk of cancer recurrence among women currently undergoing treatment for breast cancer are those with a personal history of breast cancer who use vaginal estrogen to relieve urogenital symptoms. Okay, so Loretta, if you go, if you just uh, uh, go to www.acog is in George, that's the American College of Gynecology or OBGYN, acog.org, and search on that for um, vaginal estrogen, and you can read their opinion. There's a PDF you can download too. And you can take this to your doctor. Take this to your doctor. Maria says, have you heard of some IC patients having success reducing bladder pain when doing a low oxalate diet? I didn't realize I was eating very high oxalates a couple months ago and I've been in a huge nonstop flare. You know, yes, yes. The challenge with oxalates is that they're crystals. And crystals basically end up doing very, very microscopic um, abrasions in the tissue. Um, and so uh, the oxalate diet or low oxalates was first defined, defined and utilized by patients with vulvodynia. And that certainly has spread now to the IC world. Foods that are high in oxalates are going to be chocolate, spinach, berries. And it would be an interesting experiment to give those uh, give it a try. Not everybody's oxalate sensitive. When we think about our IC subtypes, we're really thinking about IC subtype one, IC subtype two, those with a real visible bladder wall dysfunction. Um, they're going to be the ones who might be more vulnerable to oxalates. Cindy said, is less bladder function associated with IC? Well, this is where IC is not a meaningful word. It doesn't really mean anything, right? Um, and so um, let's look at our subtypes. Is less bladder function associated with Hunter's lesions? And um, with our challenge with Hunter's lesions, especially if they've been treated with fulguration, is that they're probably pretty scarred. Those bladders could be scarred, which would make it difficult for the bladder to expand as it fills with urine. So, so you know, bladder capacity might be a little bit released, uh, reduced. Uh, I see subtype two bladder wall driven. I, I, you know, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit curious about how you're using the word bladder function. Maybe I'm not understanding how you're doing that. Patients who have pelvic floor driven uh, I, um, urinary symptoms, you know, their bladder is going to be compromised by a diminished blood flow. And so is that bladder going to be functioning normally? Not as well because it doesn't have good blood supply. And then if you've got central sensitization, chronic overlapping pain conditions, I see subtype five, then we know you and I have extremely sensitive nerves. Kayleen, girl, Kayleen says, I'm feeling much worse after, I'm, I'm feeling worse almost a month after my hydro. I have primary doctor's appointment tomorrow to discuss the endometriosis. 
Uh, then post-op appointment with my urologist on Tuesday. I went to the ER last weekend due to severe blood clots and severe pelvic pain. They said I had a UTI, so I just finished the antibiotics yesterday. Before bed, uh, you had bowel movement, and that started a constant bladder spasm. Now today it feels like my bladder is exhausted. You're throwing up every day. I don't know if it's because of, oh, honey, I wish I could give you, honey, I wish I could give you a big hug. I'm so, so sorry. Well, the good news here is you got an appointment with your doctor on Tuesday. This is not normal. What's, what you're going through, Kayleen, is not normal. The fact that you feel a worse after worse a month after your hydro distension should really resonate with that urologist. The fact that you are passing big blood clots means that your, your urologist really has to do a really good assessment of your bladder, make sure that there's no continuing infection and or is, is there something else going on with your bladder that could be causing that. Did the endometriosis, for example, attach to your bladder and perforate through your bladder? You know, and that's endometriosis can do that sometimes where it attaches and then it burrows into the bladder wall and it can actually come out inside the bladder. And where do we know endometriosis also bleeds? I don't, so, oh. and the fact that you're throwing up every day, that is not good. Lay it, lay it all out on Tuesday with your urologist, girl. This doesn't make sense. Big hug, honey. Big hug. I know you're frustrated. I'm very frustrated for you. I wish I could go to your doctor's appointment with you. I really do. Because I would if you were close. Judy says, my doctor will not sign off for the microgen test. Okay. Some doctors won't. You know, and so... What you can do is you can call the company Microgen and they have a list of doctors that they use throughout the country and and you can use one of their doctors to read the to read the results and or you can try your primary care. Cindy said, Judy, uh, mine said she couldn't even read it. You know, I mean, that's a that's a valid criticism. The challenge with microgen testing and any of the next generation urine testing is that we just it's it will show us everything that's happening in your urinary tract. Good bacteria, bad bacteria, fungus and virus. And the challenge here is that, you know, we there are there are still. There's still a lot of information we need to learn about what, what a normal, healthy biome is. What's meaningful, you know, I interviewed the guy who started Microgen and I said, okay, help us understand this. At what point in time do we consider therapy with a Microgen test? So, so as an example, I had a, a Microgen test done because after my hysterectomy for almost a year, my urine was very cloudy. And I wanted to know why. I wasn't having any bladder symptoms. I wasn't having any frequency or urgency pressure pain. I just had very, very cloudy urine. And I sent it off. And what it came back as is a very, 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 very tiny overgrowth of E. coli. Tiny. And so my doctors and I made the, made the decision not to treat it with antibiotics. Because the last thing I want to do is destroy my biome. And the, and the cloudiness did eventually go away. Um, in contrast, um, so, so what he said is, if you were having active urinary symptoms and there was simply no other explanation for it and your microgen test or your next generation DNA test showed overgrowth of E. coli or urea plasma or mycoplasma that it's the combination of the findings with your symptoms that justify therapy, if that makes sense. I hope that that makes sense. But if you don't have symptoms and you just do it because you want to know what your biome is, you don't treat it. That's your biome. And, and we just, there's just still information we just don't know. Guys, our biome has been destroyed by antibiotic use for three generations now. So we don't even know really what a normal biome is. And we the other thing we know is that depending on where you harvest the urine, it's different. Urine collected from the ureters is going to have a different DNA profile than urine collected from the bladder as compared to collected from the urethra. Also, the time of day matters. Your biome in the morning is very different than your biome in the evening. 
So we're still learning. Um, uh, Jessica says, what is a microgen test? It's called a next generation DNA urine test. So rather than culturing urine, when they culture urine, what they do is they wait for something to grow. Um, so they would normally use an agar plate, which is a round plate. And they would, there's a growth medium in there. And then they would put um, uh, some of your urine on there, put a cover on it, wait 24 hours, see what grows. Or they can do a broth culture where it's done in a test tube. The challenge with a urine culture done that way is that it will only grow out the bacteria that will eat that specific growth medium. But then you have a lot of different bacteria that eat a lot of different types of food. And so urine cultures in general are kind of considered, uh, well, they're considered flawed because it, it will, again, it will only select out the bacteria that will eat that specific growth medium. In, con in contrast, next generation DNA urine testing, which is what the National Institutes of Health is using for all the current ICU research studies or most of the current ICU research studies, is they take a little tiny piece of your urine, a little tiny container of your urine, and they look for DNA. They're not trying to grow anything. They're, they're actually studying what's, what's in the urine. And they're looking for fragments of DNA or RNA. And then they compare what they find with these big databases that will then identify what that DNA normally belongs to. Uh, so next generation urine testing has been used for about a decade now. All the COVID testing now is next generation testing because it can identify viruses. Um, uh, very, very easily. And the, the big finding that our own National Institutes of Health made is that when they did next generation urine testing, what they found is that for some patients who were flaring, some IC patients who were flaring, were flaring because they had a fungal infection. They had an overgrowth of candida in their urine as compared to an overgrowth of some sort of pathogenic bacteria. If I could go back to school, because I've got two chemistry degrees on um, I would, that's what I would love to study is I would love to study the biome more. I really would. I think it's the future of care. And also um, nanoparticles, nanoparticles. That's something else I find very, very interesting. Mimi says, I've been recently diagnosed with IC. I've seen different doctors for this. I'm going to have a CAT scan tomorrow. I'm still learning about this condition. So please excuse this question. Recently, I went to the ER because the pain down there was so bad. They gave me Norco to temporarily relieve the pain. Can IC send you to the ER? Oh, girl, hell yeah. Um, this may be an obvious question, but I need to know what to expect with this condition. The urologist I'm now seeing is it has me on Urabel. Are you familiar? Thank you. All right. So Mimi, here's the deal. Um, if you have frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, and the doctor cannot figure out what's causing that, you are generally then diagnosed with a grab bag diagnosis of interstitial cystitis. But the problem is, is that interstitial cystitis has a lot of variation in it. For some people, IC begins in childhood. For others, IC begins after menopause. For some people, IC begins after chemotherapy because their bladder wall has a chemical burn. Like you, if you were drinking a lot of diet soda or using ketamine or going through chemo, that would cause a chemical burn to the bladder. While for others, it could be a chronic infection of some type, you know? And so there's a lot of diversity in the IC patient population. We're not all the same. We're not even close to being the same. So we, we've really moved away, and we have since really about 2008, we don't really think of IC as an incurable bladder disease anymore. We think of it as a pelvic pain syndrome. Why do I say that? Because structures outside of the bladder are often involved, if not driving the bladder symptoms. So... Um, what doctors have been doing now for about the last eight, nine, 10 years is they're trying to define the variants, right? And so uh, in, in Europe, for example, there are 12 variations of IC that can be diagnosed. In Canada, they use a system called U-point or input. In the United States, we're a little slow on this because our top researchers are very evidence-based. They don't want to make any major decisions until they have the research that absolutely proves it. They believe 
that there is bladder centric and beyond bladder. So they're going to go, okay, for some people, it's just the bladder. For other people, it's beyond the bladder, muscles, nerves, bones, things like that. I use a system that was created by Dr. Christopher Payne quite some time ago, six, seven years ago. And he focuses on five fundamental variants for IC. And this is what I use when I coach with patients. And I think it's brilliant. Let me get my slides here real quick. All right. So in his system, there are five fundamental subtypes. All right. So here we go. I see subtype one. Let me move this. Uh, I got to move this article. I see. And I, again, for YouTube, I think this is backwards for you, right? Peony says it feels like the pain will never go. Honey, it will. We just have to figure out where the pain's coming from. That's why we do subtyping. Okay, so the guy who invented this system is Chris Payne. He's at Vista Urology in San Jose, California, and he is retiring in two months, So, which is a, a great loss for us on the West Coast. Okay, so in his system, there's subtype number one, Hunter's lesions. Now, everybody in the world agrees if you've got Hunter's lesions on your bladder, which are big bloody wounds on your bladder, you have Hunter's lesion disease. Hunter's lesion disease is its own, it's really the only genuine disease. And only five, seven, eight percent of IC patients have Hunter's lesions. So if you have blood in your urine, if you're peeing blood clots, if you're only if you can only eat four to five foods and you have pain so high that you can't sleep, like you're literally getting up every 30 minutes, we would really be looking at Hunter's lesions. There are a couple of theories as to what drives Hunter's lesions. Theory number one is that it's neuroinflammation, that it's a nerve that's massively inflamed. Theory number two is it's a virus living on those nerves. Um, the viral research started in Europe where they found the polyoma BK virus in the urine of patients with Hunter's lesions. The Americans several years later confirmed that data that they too found polyoma virus in the urine of a small percentage of patients. All right. Um, and then the third theory is something I just put a blog on our website, icnetwork.org, and that was a woman who had her posterior fornix syndrome repaired. Her uterus had twisted, and she had a massive prolapse. When they when they fixed her prolapse, they got her bladder back in the right spot, and they had her ur her uterus turned back in the proper position. Her Hunter's lesions healed completely, which kind of supports a neuroinflammatory process potentially. So again, this is really just five, seven, eight percent of patients. Okay, I see subtype two, bladder wall driven, bladder wall driven. These are the patients who, yeah, there's legitimately something wrong with the bladder wall. So concept number one is chemical irritation. So these are the patients who are using, who have going through chemotherapy or they're using ketamine recreationally or they're drinking way too much soda, especially diet soda. Yeah, the bladder can be injured. And when the bladder wall is injured, urine hurts, you know, and the fuller you get, the worse you feel. And as soon as you pee, you feel better. That tells us that the bladder wall is driving some of these symptoms. So again, number one, we're going to be looking at chemical in injury. The second thing we're going to be looking at in this group, Mimi, is we're going to be looking at estrogen atrophy. Because guess what? So this is what's so cool about the bladder. The bladder is the only organ in the human body designed to hold toxic waste. Urine contains ammonia, urea, and all sorts of stuff. So how can the bladder hold ammonia for hours at a time and not get damaged? And the answer is that your bladder is like your mouth. It's a hollow organ covered with a really, really thick coating of mucus. We call it the mighty mucus. And the purpose of the mucus is to be a barrier. It protects the skin. It prevents the ammonia in your urine from reaching the, the cells of your bladder wall. And it also makes it much more difficult for bacteria to infect the bladder wall. It's a nice thick coating of mucus. Unfortunately, it is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, you have lots of mucus and you're good. You can get away with crap like drinking a lot of soda. When you're older, you have much less estrogen, you have much less mucus, thus your bladder's ability to defend itself is now compromised. That is not a disease, that is aging, that is the loss of estrogen. And so if you've had a hysterectomy, if you've gone through chemocystitis, or if you're, age, if you're in your 40s or 50s, 
we have to consider estrogen atrophy as potentially driving your symptoms. If your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, so is your urethra, so is your bladder. And the urethra is kind of like the canary in the coal mine. It's a urethra that really often starts to scream first when it starts getting dry. Okay, so if your urethra screaming, if your urethra feels like there's a drop of urine stuck in there that won't come out, you know, again, we want to look potentially at the quality and health of your skin, not a disease. We're not going to treat it like a disease. It is just dryness. We have to restore the integrity of the health uh, and health of the skin. The way that we do that is with estrogen. If you give that skin some estrogen, it will start producing mucus. Um, and or maybe doing a therapy that will provide a little bit of an extra coating on the bladder. That's what Elmeron used to do, but we're really not using Elmeron so much anymore because of its connection to eye disease. So you would instead be looking at one of the chondroitin-based supplements. Chondroitin also provides a protective coating in the bladder. And we had research presented uh, a year and a half ago that showed that chondroitin was the most effective at restoring the integrity of the, uh, uh, the superficial integrity of the bladder wall. So the chondroitin-based supplements are going and you can find them all on our website, are gonna be Bladder Builder, Bladder Rest, Cysto Men, Cysto Protect. Those are, those are really, and Cysto Reno. Those are the five fundamental, most popular um, and, and most logical uh, supplements that might help provide a protective coating to the bladder. All right. And then also in this subtype, which again, we're talking about IC subtype two bladder wall driven. We do want to consider the concept of chronic infection. Could there be a chronic bacterial infection or could there be a chronic fungal infection? And that's where next generation urine testing might be helpful because typical urine cultures do not identify fungal infection but next generation testing does. And for many of you watching this who have had it done, some of you have had found, discovered that, yeah, you, you too had candida in your urine. I had candida in my bladder for two years. It was brutal. Let me tell you, candida infection, far more painful than a bacterial infection. At least that was my experience. I was a lunatic when I had my candida infection. And that was from taking too many antibiotics back. I did the old Paul Fugas auto protocol. All right, so anyway, let's move on. What's the third subtype? The third subtype is the biggest subtype, and that is pelvic floor driven. It turns out that, you know, I, I call it the, well, let's see, how do I wanna say this? You know, um, Western medicine fails the typical pelvic pain patient because doctors like to stay in their sandbox. Urologists stay in the urinary tract, gynecologists stay in the reproductive tract, gastroenterologists stay in the bowel, et cetera, et cetera. They don't necessarily explore relationships. The pelvis is a small confined area with a lot of stuff going on. You've got, again, you've got your organs, you've got skeletal muscle that helps you open and close your legs and walk. It connects your your torso to your pelvis. It connects your legs up into your pelvis. There's a lot of muscles happening in your pelvis. Uh, you got big blood vessels and you got nerves. So the question is, is can muscles change organ behavior? And the answer is yes. It's called a somatovisceral reflex. If you have fallen on your tailbone, or let's say you fall on your hip. Let's say you're an ice skater or a gymnast and you fell all the time. You are suffering a compression injury. Muscles are being compressed. Blood vessels are being compressed. Blood vessels are being broken because that's why you get a bruise because you got blood, you know, you've got broken blood vessels under there that are oozing blood underneath your skin. And nerves can be, nerves can also be damaged. Nerves often get damaged because their blood supply is limited because their blood supply is damaged. So um, um, our therapeutic priority for this patient, if your symptoms really, if began after a fall, a car accident, having a baby, or if you were a dancer, a ballet, a ballet dancer, or a football player, anything that involved repetitive trauma to the pelvis, then we absolutely want to look at your muscles and make sure your muscles are healthy. Because if your muscles are super, super tight, like my muscles are super, super tight, you've got diminished blood supply. 
And that's not good. The bladder wall cannot be healthy if it doesn't have good blood supply. And so our therapeutic priority for these folks is to restore blood supply. And we, the way we do that is by working with the muscles. In 2000, and, so I understand this. If you go back 100 years and you look at all the papers that were published on IC, urologists were constantly describing tight muscles. Muscles so tight, they resemble piano strings. But urologists were focused on the bladder. So they were observing tight muscles, but they didn't do anything about it. They didn't do anything about it. And then we had a brave physical therapist about 20 years ago named Rhonda Cotterinos, who is the one who went, hmm, let's see if we can try to fix these muscles. And she had remarkable success at improving IC patients. So she started coming to the urology meetings. And they laughed at her. They walked out of the room when she was talking. When they finally gave her a, a, a moment at the podium, it was the last speaker of the day. And most of the audience walked out before she even talked. And yet she was a tough woman. And she kept coming back. Muscle, muscle, muscle. Guys, when I work with the muscles, I can improve these patient symptoms. She was able to convince the National Institutes of Health to do a research study. And in 2008, that data was, was released. And that data proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that pelvic floor physical therapy was stunningly effective at reducing IC symptoms of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. And that was the moment in 2008, the IC world was turned on its head because up to that point, everybody's going incurable bladder disease, incurable bladder disease, incurable bladder disease. But hell, if it's a bladder disease, why would working with muscles help? Uh-oh, uh-oh, maybe muscles are involved. Maybe muscles are involved. And now we believe that muscles are involved for most of us. I mean, it, it is my opinion that the great majority of IC patients actually have an underlying muscle disorder. I call this the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Also, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor. They're both involved to some degree because they're so interconnected. You cannot separate them. If your bladder is screaming in pain, your muscles are going to get tight to protect them. If your muscles are hurt, and they're super, super tight, the bladder is going to break down. So our job here is to figure out what's primary and what's secondary. If, we, if your symptoms began after chemotherapy, we know exactly what happened and our goal is to calm and soothe the bladder, hoping that the muscles release. But if your symptoms began after having a baby, bladder therapies are probably not gonna help at all. What we have to do is work with the muscles, restore blood supply, and hope that the bladder heals with better blood supply. Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of? Okay. Um, so in terms of symptom differences, uh, let's get real here. Okay. So somebody with pelvic floor dysfunction, um, you're not as tied to the bladder. I mean, to the bathroom, if you had Hunter's lesions or you really bled chemical injury of your bladder wall, you're, you're connected, man, there's a, there's a, a, a rope between you and the bathroom and you were in and out of that bathroom every hour. Easy. With pelvic floor, you're not quite as frequent you might feel a pulling sensation or a pushing sensation or a falling sensation, like something's falling out of you or feeling like there's something stuck in your vagina that won't come out. But the number one symptom uh, that tells us you've got pelvic floor is that when you go to pee, you can't release your urine right away, that you're hesitating five, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds, 40 seconds before you can relax enough to let your urine out. Okay. So if you hesitate um, or, you know, you're stopping and starting or, um, I mean, kind of, that's really how I know what the health of my muscles are is, can I just go in and have a normal pee? Then I'm good. But if I'm hesitating or I'm stopping and starting, um, then I know that I've got to work on my muscles again. Caitlin says pressure is the worst for me. Pressure, bladder pressure is a weird symptom. I, I mean, you know, I don't think I've ever felt pressure. I think pressure, a, a symptom of pressure is kind of a brain, your brain's interpretation of pain, maybe. Um, um, but on the other hand, 
if your bladder's overly full, I can I can send I could feel that pressure. I can I can understand why that pressure symptom would happen. I've just never had that symptom of pressure before. I don't know what that personally feels like. For me, when I had pain, believe me, I had pain and I was, you know, crying my eyes out because of the pain. But my subtype is is not a bladder wall subtype. My subtype is a pelvic floor subtype. Um, and the number one injury we see with patients with pelvic floor is tailbone injuries. You have a tailbone injury, then you probably have some pelvic floor going on. I see subtype four pudendal neuralgia. So these are the patients who have a nerve issue going on. Uh, a nerve is being compressed. So if you have pain as you sit down, that is, re that is relieved when you stand up, that's probably a nerve that's being compressed by muscles when you sit down. Or if you feel a vibration, a, a, a sensation, or you feel like you're sitting on a cell phone on vibrate, or if you have sciatica, if you've got random pain shooting down your leg, or if you've got pins and needles, or if you have PGAD, persistent genital arousal disorder, where you feel this arousal sensation, but it sure as hell isn't fun, it hurts. That is usually the pudendal nerve that is being compressed by tight muscles. So our therapeutic priority for this group of patients is to figure out which nerve is being compressed and to relieve that. Um, and I think our one of our biggest challenges here is that we all sit so much um, that, you know, it, that sitting can create long-term havoc with your pelvic floor, as I am personally going through right now. All right. And then our last subtype is central sensitization, chronic overlapping pain conditions. So for these patients, their symptoms are really being driven by their central nervous system. This is also my subtype. So characterized by very, very sensitive skin. Like I can't wear wool. I can't wear textures. I can't wear waffle knits. I have to wear my pajamas inside out to sleep at night, right? Because the seams bother me. Um, we tend to be food sensitive, not just for our bladders, but our whole body. We tend to be chemically sensitive. But the most common symptom is a really wicked sense of smell. We can smell things that other people can't smell and smells drive us crazy. Smell is a brain function. It is an absolute brain function. You might even be visually sensitive where there's a funky pattern in a carpet or a wallpaper. It drives your eyes crazy. And you have to close your eyes and turn away. That's driven by extreme nerve sensitivity that can be inherited as it is in my family. Hello, red hair. Um, um, but it can also happen after trauma and it can also happen after bullying. Um, we see a con what the brain scans show for those of us with chronic overlapping pain conditions is that our brain is stuck in fight or flight, that we're not relaxing normally. And I can talk about that later if you want to. So again, Mimi, um, our, our goal here now is, okay, so somebody's given you a diagnosis of IC. Now we have to try to understand what's driving your symptoms. Is it your bladder? Is it your pelvic floor? Is it, or is it a nerve or muscle, right? That's, that's where we are right now. And it's very exciting because we can cure some patients now. Patients with pelvic floor driven symptoms are curable. Pudendal neuralgia might even be curable. Central sensitization, on the other hand, if you've inherited that central sensitization as I have, that's not curable. That's I've, my job to learn to live with that. But for other people, if that central sensitization is because of uh, uh, bullying, we can repair the brain. We know how to repair the brain from that. It's with mind-body medicine. Does a tube of estrogen expire? Yes, but it takes a long time. Vicki says, what causes flares during illness? Well, inflammation can cause flares for the patients who are getting COVID-associated cystitis. So if you have a flare after you've had COVID, that's an inflammatory process that's happening throughout your body, including in your bladder. Um, and... Um, Let's see. Uh, also, we have to look at the fact that if you've been sick, the odds are somebody's telling you to take a lot of vitamin C, drinking orange juice, things like that. You could have some acid irritation of the bladder wall or because you've been laying around a lot and not moving, there could maybe be a muscle component to it, too. It's hard to say. Amy says, my urologist wants me to have a colonoscopy to see if a colon issue is perhaps causing the IC pain to worsen. Have you ever heard of that? 
Uh, I have had a colonoscopy. I have an article on our website on uh, IC friendly colonoscopy preps. Again, I, I, I don't like guessing. I like facts. And so if you have gotten significantly worse and there is any sort of bowel component to it, having a colonoscopy is not a bad idea because it can rule stuff out. But you also have to understand that tight pelvic floor muscles will also affect the colon and the bowel. I've gone through period. I, I did a new workout routine like two weeks ago and holy hell did it mess up my pelvic floor, specifically my levator muscles. Uh, um, here, let me get my thingy. Let me get my my handy dandy model here. So, so look, this is your pelvic cavity. And the thing that makes the treating muscles and the pelvis difficult is that the muscles are inside the cavity. They run along the inside of the bones, right? And that's why when you have muscle work, it's usually a finger in your vagina touching muscles or a finger in your rectum, which you can do too. I did that this morning. Um, and so the muscles you can see tend to be flat and along the bone. So I did a, a new workout routine. I'm still paying for it. It's got, it's got to be three weeks now. Um, so here is your ex, the lowest level of muscles. These are your levator muscles, right? But for me, what the workout did so here's my tailbone, is it made these muscles right here, right along. Here's your sit bone, right? So these are the bone, prominent bones in your tush if you push in. Right along here, right along here, these went into a hard spasm. And what happens then is when these muscles start to get really, really tight and spasm, they can call it levator anti syndrome. Um, is that your rectum starts to burn. Your, it, I mean, you get a strong burning sensation in your rectum, which is what I felt. Very intense, very, very intense burning right along here. And again, right along the inside of my sit bones. And I'm just now getting those out of spasm. Like, holy hell. Like I tried to play a game last night and I lasted, I could sit for two hours. I couldn't sit longer than that. And then, then those muscles started screaming at me. Valerie says, I developed, I see in my first year of menopause, not sure if there's connection. There's huge connection, huh? And that means you probably have what we call the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, estrogen atrophy. So again, for you, the, the goal here is to have your doctor look at the quality and health of your skin. If your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, then so is your urethra, so is your bladder. That's why your bladder is so sensitive. That's why foods you used to be able to eat, you can't eat now because your bladder doesn't have the mucus to protect itself. And so therapeutically, again, for you, we would be looking at something that would provide a little bit of an extra protective coating on the bladder wall itself something like bladder builder or bladder rest. Lori says, what causes, causes polyonephritis? I'm not sure, hun, that's not something I've read up on. Uh, what, what can't you eliminate? Let's see, also, can't you eliminate some of your flares by your diet? If you're IC subtype one or IC subtype two, hunters, lesions, or bladder well driven diet matters. Diet really matters because if you've got an open wound in your bladder and you're pouring acid on it every day in the form of coffee or soda, that wound will never heal. Uh, but if your symptoms are pelvic floor driven, your bladder, you know, diet's not going to play that big of a role. Okay. Oh. I'm tired today. You know, it's been a long week. We're going into another fire alert tonight. I think that's why I'm tired. Yeah, the wind, the wind is starting to blow. So they could turn off our power later. 
I just want this to be over. I want fall to be over. Can we just fast forward to Christmas? Let's skip Thanksgiving. Let's just fast forward to Christmas. Middle of December. Get some good rain in. We're good to go. It's the torture going from September to December that's stressful for those of us who live in California or Oregon or Washington or Utah or Colorado. Elizabeth says, my urologist wants to do urethral stretching under anesthesia along with injecting steroids into my hunter's lesions. Do you recommend urethral stretching? No, absolutely not. No. So, you know, uh, we call that a urethral dilation. Urethral dilations were very popular 30 years ago when I first had my symptoms in seventh grade in the 70s. Uh, I had about 100 urethral dilations. My, it was like trying to pee through a needle. My urethra was super, super tight. And so their answer to that was to force a, a, a metal rod in there to try to get, open it up. And of course that hurt like hell. Um, but they never asked why, why is your urethra being squeezed in the first place? And the answer is hello, tight muscles. So a couple of years ago at the American Urology Association conference in the IC class, a foreign a uh, doctor asked the American panelists, do you do urethral dilations anymore? And the doctor that answered, and I don't remember who it was, it might have been Rob Evans, Robert Evans, our top doctor in the country, uh, but I don't remember exactly who said it. He said, no, we don't rape the urethra anymore. So they consider urethral dilations raping the urethra. Instead, we, what we want to do is we're going to try to figure out why their urethra is narrow in the first place. So, you know, it, it, there comes a point where if your urethra is so tight that it can't pass urine, that becomes an emergency. And yes, they would do a dilation then. Hey, man, I'm here today. I had about 100 of them. It's not, you know, but now we're really focusing on cause and effect. We want to try to understand the cause that's causing the urethra to be narrow. Or understand the cause that's causing your muscles to be constantly tight. You know, you, you, and that's when we have to look at bones. I want you to look at how these muscles attach to the sacrum. Here's the sacrum and the tailbone. But if this tailbone is out of position to the, to the side, right, or you have one leg higher than the other, uh, or you have a bad hip, or you have a bad SI joint, or you have a bad knee, or even a bad foot, muscles can uh, be kept under stress and tension by a bony structure abnormality. And so if you're not responding to pelvic floor physical therapy, if you are continuing to stay tight, no matter what they do, we have to take a look at your bones and let's see if there's a bony structure problem going on. Research study a couple years ago found, or a year ago, about 18, no, 15 months ago, found that 70% of the men who had testicular pain had an underlying hip abnormality that required referral to orthopedics to fix their hip. So again, we're really taking a much more robust look at the, what, the, the foundation of the pelvis, not just the organs, but the bones and the muscles and the nerves, et cetera, and the blood supply. Jessica said, let's see. I had big blots with my hydrogen, big blood clots with my hydrogen extension afterwards. My urologist was puzzled. She didn't know why. She did do a biopsy. Uh, I then didn't have the hospital do a bladder scan, so I retained urine. It's the worst pain. I then had a nurse put my catheter in wrong. I looked back and I could have sued. So the fact that you had big blood clots after hydrogen extension really says that number one, should they either they either massively overstretched your your bladder during the hydro distension with an old style method of doing the hydros, they call them high pressure, long duration, where you fill up the bladder with a lot of fluid and keep it in there under high pressure for a long period of time. That can physically damage the bladder, that can rupture the bladder and cause bleeding. Or if you have Hunter's lesions, Hunter's lesions are known for what they call a waterfall effect of bleeding. They can bleed profusely during hydro distension. Anytime you're sent home from the hospital with a catheter after hydro distension, your bladder has been injured. They might not tell you your bladder has been injured, but that is not normal. Sometimes they might tell you afterwards. 
But, you know, if you come home from a, any hospital procedure like a hydro distension with a catheter, that usually means that they need to keep the catheter, keep the bladder empty while the, while the tissues are trying to heal. <clears throat> Matt, I did see that. I just haven't had a chance to respond. Jessica, Jessica says, I got diagnosed with IC when I was 38 years old. You're 44 now. I was diagnosed with IC when I was 32, but I had my first symptoms when I was 14. Mar Marla says, is it the chemicals from the diet soda or the carbonation? It's both. The carbonation is driven by carbonic acid. But really, we're looking at the citric acid added for flavoring, as well as any NutraSweet, which, which is metabolized into formic acid and formaldehyde. Those, that is why you may never, ever, 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 God, believe me, ever drink diet soda again with NutraSweet. Um, we now have a direct connection between aspartame and cancer because NutraSweet is broken down into uh, uh, wood alcohol, which is then, which is toxic, which is then broken down into formic acid and formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a known carcinogen. Susan says, have you heard of any results with hyperbaric oxygen? Yes, we do have some limited studies with hyperbaric oxygen and interstitial cystitis. Specifically, hyperbaric oxygen uh, was found the most effective at hunter, treating Hunter's lesions. Jill says, oh, Jill, 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 Jill. It's always nice to meet another Jill who also has proctalgia fugax. So Jill says, besides bladder tenderness and frequency, I have bouts of proctalgia fugax. Because of this, I speculate pelvic floor is the issue. Yes, girl, it is the issue. Proctalgia fugax means that you are having rectal spasms. These random, extremely painful spasms at your rectum or by your rectum that stop you in your tracks for five or 10 minutes, and then they go away. And you're like going, what the hell? They're really strong, painful spasms. And the book that talks about that is, this book, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain by Dr. Jerome Weiss. I recommend this to anybody with pelvic floor issues at all. It is a game changer. It changed my life. I love this book and it is free on Kindle Unlimited. So come on, guys, it's freaking free. If you have a if you have a phone, if you got an iPad and you are part of Kindle, come on, get it. It's free. Read it. Uh, if you want the print version because you like to study like I do and highlight things like I do, you can get the print version in our store for twenty nine dollars. It's thirty five dollars on Amazon. So this is the first book that's ever talked about these really painful rectal spasms that we call proctalgia fugax. Um, and here it is right here. So let me just read this part a little bit. Proctalgia fugax, the ultimate anorectal pain. The term proctalgia fugax may sound somewhat comical, but believe me, the problem it designates does not make its sufferers laugh. Proctalgia is a Greek derivative that denotes pain near the rectum. Thankfully, the word fugax means fleeting. When you experience a stunning, deep anorectal pain, fleeting is what you pray for and wiped out is how you are likely to feel when it ends. The upside is that proctalgia fugax attacks are generally are usually brief and they generally subside as one gets older. I have to say that mine have definitely gotten way better, rarely occurring after the age of 70. Um, estimated 14% of population has this. The instance is higher in patients with gastrointestinal intestinal problems. Let's see. Uh, these attacks come on suddenly with only, brief, with only a brief premonition that one might be coming on. And during an attack, one may be completely incapacitated and unable to move. While generally severe, the spasm lasts from seconds to five minutes. Some patients have reported episodes 10 minutes or longer. 
It's been compared to the pain of natural childbirth, kidney stones, gallbladder attacks. As for the quality of the pain, it runs from cramping, gnawing, and sickening to like a shark object piercing the rectum. So what causes it? The mainstream medical community considers proctalgia fugas to be poorly understood, benign disorder of the GI tract. However, based on my clinical findings, I feel comfortable declaring pudendal neuralgia or trigger points of the pelvic floor, specifically the puborectalis muscles, to be the clear cause. And then he supports, so what can trigger these attacks? Sitting for long periods, hello my life, sex, extreme stress, physical exhaustion, constipation or straining with bowel movements, IBS. There you go. And treatment is going to be an evaluation of the nerve and the pelvic floor. Um, so uh, Jill, you need to get this book. It will change your life. It is that good. And yes, pelvic floor is in your future. Pelvic floor work. Let's see. Kayleen says, I wonder if it's type three I've, uh, I have because my doctors are saying the only reason why I'm seeing a urologist is because of chronic pelvic pain. I've fallen on my tailbone too many times to even count. Yeah. Marlea is saying are, um, that glucosamine and chondroitin for joint health can also be helpful to take. I am considering taking it for stiff joints. Yeah, you got to be careful of your source of chondroitin, though. Chondroitin is sourced from, it can be sourced from shark fin, which we do not want to support. It's decimating the shark population. It's very cruel. It can come from cow trachea, which is banned in Europe for the risk of mad cow disease. So Europe sends their questionable cow trachea where to the United States, where our companies are more than happy to use it and not tell you the risk. So those are two sources we don't want, shark fin or cow trachea. You want it from chicken. All right, let me come over to Facebook. I mean, to YouTube real quick. Uh, Eileen says, I do my pelvic floor therapy and I've been doing doing it for over a year. Whoops, I'm bleeding. Oh, I scratched myself. Uh, I take 20 minutes a day along with every other day using my wand for five minutes and it works for me. Yeah, that's what you have to do. It's all about the consistency with the pelvic floor. Uh, p &E says, how can doctors see if my ligament to my uterus is torn? They keep telling me it's tipping, it's no big deal, but I'm in pain. p &E, go over to our website, icnetwork.org, and go to the blog. The, the title is Hunter's Lesions Miraculously Cured by Prolapse Repair. It's right on the front page of our website. Eileen says, I was diagnosed at 32. I'm 60 now. I think I had IC way back. Had frequency at five years of age. There's so much more info now and directions. Thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Eileen, you and I, sisters. <laughs> yeah, we're sisters. I was diagnosed at 32. You were diagnosed at 32. I'm 61. You're 60. And now we're navigating the whole crazy getting older thing. It's weird, isn't it? I don't understand aging. I do not. I do not understand it at all because in my brain, I'm 24. I'm 24. My my brain cannot cannot accept the fact that my body is 61 years old, but my aches and pains definitely support that. Oh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for the 500 stars on Facebook. I really appreciate, appreciate that, hon. She says, yeah, Jill, you're awesome. So thank you for your dedication. You've helped me get through this some tough times. Oh, honey, thank you. I'm not perfect. I'm sure I make mistakes, um, but I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. Jill says, sometimes if I'm startled at night, my bladder then goes crazy, fight or flight, nerve. My sense of smell is ridiculous. My family comments about it all the time. So, Jill, guess what? We're twins. <laughs> We're twins.
We're Jills who have central sensitization. And a lot of that's inherited. A lot of that's inherited. If you, uh, if you're a redhead, if you've got redheads in your family, redheads absolutely have a very different nervous system than people who are not redheaded. We have more nerves quantitatively than most people have. It's harder to numb us for dental work, for example. Um, but that, that fight or flight can also be the result of trauma or it can be the result of childhood abuse or bullying. And so we have to work on that. We have to work on getting our brains out of fight or flight. Caitlin says, yes, I heard redheads feel more pain. We do. You know, we do. It's, it's, you know, it's surreal to grow up this way. And, and, you know, you're asking anybody, everybody else, do you have pain when you have your period? It's like, no, I just cramps. Like I have pain. I had pain. And you kind of feel batty. I mean, because you're you talk to a lot of different people, but you realize you're not talking to other redheads. And you have to talk with other redheads to understand the double reset the double recessive gene that makes that changes our brain to the point that we experience pain very, very differently. Marlia says, talk about the brain not functioning. I have fibromyalgia and every nerve ending and my body is on high alert. So again, that's chronic overlapping pain conditions. If you've got IC, vulvodynia, IBS, TMJ, fibromyalgia, migraines, if you have just two of those, you are diagnosed with chronic overlapping pain conditions. And that's a central nervous system disorder characterized by the brain being stuck in fight or flight and the brain scans show it. It's not a mental illness. Nobody is saying this is a mental illness. It is called a central nervous system maladaption. It means that the, a normal process in the brain is not happening. So the best way, I can, the best example I can give you is, there are, there are two examples I can give you. Imagine, um, okay, this is my, this is my reality right now. Okay. If I look out the window and I see a fire, I'm going into fight or flight. I'm absolutely going into fight or flight. That is the, that is your brain's responsibility to save your life. So if it sees fire, it goes, oh my God, what, ha what happens? The amygdala turns on in your brain and it sends out adrenaline. When adrenaline actually it's the amygdala, the source of your, well, the adrenaline is part of the fight or flight response. I, I might be wrong in saying the amygdala is sending it out, but the amygdala turns on, that controls fight or flight. Your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases, your muscles get tight to protect you from the threat because your body thinks, your brain thinks your life is at stake. Fire, my life is at stake as it was last year when the fire got three houses away. Okay. But once the fire is gone, the fire department's come, they put out the fire, it's gone. That should turn off and the and parasympathetic nervous system should take over. What does the parasympathetic nervous system do? It turns off the amygdala, it reduces your heart rate, it reduces your blood pressure and it relaxes your muscles. But what the brain scans show for patients with chronic overlapping pain conditions is that that's not happening. We're stuck in fight or flight. So I attended a conference exactly a year ago, the International Pelvic Pain Conference, uh, Pain Society Conference. It was fantastic. I mean, I knew the brain scans were coming, to, were, were going on, but I could not talk about them because I did not understand them now. And I thought they were scary. Now they're not scary at all. Now everything totally makes sense. So, and the example they used in a conference is a woman who had um, uh, uh, painful periods when she was a kid, and then she had endometriosis, and then she had vulvodynia. So in her 20s, something happened. Then in her 30s, something happened. Then in her 40s, something happened. And by the time she was in her 50s, she had widespread pain throughout her body. So why does this happen? Why does this happen to some people, not other people? What the research shows, what the research shows is that 80% of the people that this happens to, 
it's because of a major physical trauma, usually in childhood, like getting hit by a car, or breaking a leg. I've worked with both. I worked with a patient on Friday who was hit by a car as a child, another one who um, broke, her, uh, broke her leg in three places as a child, right? Those are big injuries. And I think that we have to accept the fact that children in pain are often ignored. And so that child is crying in pain and nobody's helping them. Of course, their brain is going to be in fight or flight. Uh, and there is a school of thought that children don't feel pain like adult does, which is a load of crap. Uh, I was at a National Institutes of Health conference where our only IC child, ch uh, IC and children researcher, Dr. George Schuster, said from the podium, children didn't feel bladder pain, which was a load of crap. That was the first time I ever spoke at a conference. I got up and I said, you're wrong. And I told the story of a mother who had two daughters that I was working with and the daughters were crying and paying and begging God to take them. It was that bad. And thankfully, Lowell Parsons, again, one of the top IC researchers, stood up behind me and said, Jill's absolutely right. Children feel pain. So imagine the consequences of untreated pain on the brain in a child. It's profound. So again, the research found that 80% of the children who develop chronic overlapping pain conditions had suffered a major physical trauma. But the other 20% had either been abused or bullied. And that's the perfect example that I can give you, because I want you to think about bullying for a moment at a child, because I also, as a redhead, was bullied as a child. So imagine you've got a really bad bully at school who hurts you. So you, so imagine that child, as soon as they wake up in the morning and says, honey, come on, you got to get up. It's time to go to school. Your brain goes into fight or flight. You don't want to go to school. You don't want to be, you don't want to see the bully. You don't want to be hit. You don't want to be hurt. You don't want to be humiliated. Right? And the closer you get to school, the more hypervigilant you are. Oh my God, where's the bully? Is he there? Oh my God, he's here. Is he there? Is he there? Oh, there's one of his friends. Oh my God, I got to run away. That is a brain in fight or flight. And that child is in fight or flight all day. And the only time they're out of fight or flight is when they walk in the door. Because we were in fight or flight leaving school because the bully chased us. Right? So you might get three hours, four hours of normal relaxation in that young child until mom says, hey, man, you got to take a bath. Got to go to school tomorrow. You enter fight or flight. What the research shows is that 20 days of that... 20 days of bullying changes the brain for the worse. You can see what happens in the brain. You can see how that affects the brain. The different parts of the brain area light up. Other parts of the brain slow down. And it is not good. So 20 days of bullying will change your brain function. But there's great news. Because 20 days of mind-body medicine will repair that damage. It will repair that damage. It will restore normal, healthy brain function. And so what do we know about patients who have chronic overlapping pain conditions? Anxiety disorder. I had anxiety disorder in my 20s, 30s. You notice I say had because I don't have it so much anymore because I, I learned some good skills. I haven't had a panic attack since I took a course 25 years ago. Praise God, hallelujah. I wish I'd taken it as a kid. Wasted 15 years suffering with anxiety every day. Right? And we can talk about that later. So anyway, if you've got chronic overlapping pain conditions and if you if you got wicked if you've got wickedly sensitive skin and a wicked sense of smell, that's about your brain. It's central sensitization. You are not alone. I am your sister. I am absolutely your sister. And we can fix it. We know how to fix it. It's about good sensory information and we can talk about that later. Marlia says, talk about the brain not functioning in nerve sensitization, fibro, right, okay. Denise says, Jill, I look so, I, I look so forward to listening to you speak. It's like, you know what I'm thinking. <laughs> I never know. I don't prepare for these meetings. It's just completely off the cuff, guys. I mean, unless something big has happened. Um, speaking of something big, oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, so if you're on my mailing list, you're going to be getting an email tomorrow because we have now officially released Bladder Tracker, our new free application. 
This is fantastic. Now we originally were going to charge for it uh, with a you know with a team that was working on it, but then we decided no, well, let's do it for free. So bladder tracker will not only allow you to track your frequency urgency, it will allow you to track your pain. It will allow you to track where your pain is. It will allow you to track your stress. It will allow you to track what you're eating, what you're drinking, your exercise level, and even intimacy. Now, here's why this is important. This is important. My goal with this was to give you a tool that could be produce a report that you could put into your medical records. Because if you are so ill that you might need to go out on disability, we need proof. We need proof over time that you're not doing well. And the problem is frequency is very subjective. It's not objective. But bladder tracker makes it subjective. I mean, it makes it objective. So let's just go through this. So this is available right now for free in the Google Play Store and in the Apple App Store. Um, and it's still a work in progress. I'm really hoping you're going to let me know if you find problems with it, right? So let's just do it. Let's just do it so you all can see it. So I'm going to click track now. So the first cool thing about it is that you never have to enter date or time. It's all automatically recorded. OK, so we're going to go first with wellness. Oh, let me see. Hold on. Let me delete that one. So the first thing it's going to ask you is, you know, how are you doing today? And it's colors. Good, medium, bad. Right. So I'm feeling, well, let's see, my, my pelvic floor is tight. So I'm going to say, well, okay, no, I'm still good. So I'm going to say, okay, log entry. All right, now I'm going to go to urination, right? So now I'm going to do the control panels across the top. So now I'm going to enter a void. So let's just all pretend we've just gone to the bathroom. I'm going to do a log new entry. And it's going to ask you, do you have pain before urination? And my answer is, nope. Do you have pain after urination? And my answer is, a mm, little bit, because my levator and our muscles are tight. Do you, how is your stream? How's your urine stream? My stream is a little stoppy and sturdy right now because my muscles are tight. You can measure how long your pee is, just to show duration, get, get information. And if this happens in the middle of the night, you can actually say, did it wake you up at night? Now, I did not get up at night to pee. So I'm going to say no, but this is actually, let's just, we're just pretending we just peed. All right. Now, let's see, hold on. You can measure your stress and anxiety level. This is important to track because you will feel worse when you're under stress. That's what happens in the brain. Stress will, uh, if there's stress, your brain will intensify the pain. So I'm going to click a log a new entry. What is my stress level right now? My stress level is, uh, my stress level is moderate because we're going into another fire thing, right? Okay, so I'm going to click log entry. Okay, now I'm going to go up to my pain. Pain. So let's log an entry for pain. Yeah, I'm in pain today, but I don't have bladder pain. So this says, where is your pain located? Your bladder, your pelvic floor, your lower back, your rectum, your urethra, your perineum, your vulva, your tip of your penis. My pain is pelvic floor. So I'm picking pelvic floor. And then you get to say what, what the character of the pain is. Burning, pins and needles, aching, shocking, pressure. Mine is in my left butt cheek, uh, burning right now. Okay. Then what's really cool is you can also track any supplements or treatments you're doing so that you can look at your, your progress over time, right? I mean, that's important. So let's log a new entry. And we've already pre-built in here the top supplements because, you know, hello, we just don't have too many. We, I mean, our only oral uh, drug for IC now causes blindness. So supplements are where it is right now or bladder installations. So we have preloaded in here some of the top supplements. We've got uh, Allopath, Biome Defense, Bladder Builder, Bladder Rest, Bladder Smart, Sister Man and Sister and Pura. Those are the, the reason why we have those is because our partner on this who helped pay for the development of this is Natural Approach Nutrition. Okay. So I take Pura and I take two. And I'm just going to click track. Okay. Oh, my back hurts. 
Okay, it will allow you to list the foods you're, you've eaten today. It will allow you to track your water intake for the day. Whenever you drink a glass of water, you can enter it. Your exercise, your sleep. How'd you sleep last night? All right, so I'm going to log a new sleep entry. Did you sleep less than three hours, three to six, six to nine? I, I slept six to nine hours. I'm usually sleeping about six, seven hours. I'm going to log that entry, et cetera. So, and then what makes this app all the more, because there's nothing in the app store like that. This is taking avoiding diary. It's like avoiding diary on steroids. It is. It does so many different things. You can then use your analytics and do an analysis. So here's a single day report. See that where you can just look at how you're doing that day or you can do a 30 day report, right? So you can generate that report and then you can see here. So now the report is generated. You can save it to yourself. You can message it to yourself, mail it to yourself, whatever. And you can, um, you can print it out. Take it to your doctor, get it in your medical records, right? So anyway, that's the other big thing. Oh, holy hell, we spent a lot of money this year for, that is uh, not going to come back to us. This app cost uh, at least $20,000 to build. But, you know, there are some things worth building. Can we send it to the doctor? You, you bet you can, but you should send it to yourself, print it out, look at it before you send it to the doctor. Suzanne says, I downloaded the app, but it will not let me set up an account. When I click on it, it says invalid email. Uh, Suzanne, uh, pop me an email, icnetwork at map.com, and I'll send that to the developer because it is, you know, it is free. It's not perfect. And there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to have to fix. Okay. <laughs> Gwen says, holy moly, I think we should donate at least 10. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> Eileen says, signing off. It's almost 530 here. Be well, honey. Be well. I know people like think that there's this big giant, you know, million dollar company that is pharmaceutical company that's sponsoring everything. And guys, literally, it's like, the small business IC network that has three employee, four, three or four employees and another small business working together, you know, we're just trying to be innovative. Melanie says I was diagnosed with IC about eight years ago. You just been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia. My rheumatologist has given me hydroxychloroquine and I'm afraid to take it. Well, I think you need to really d address your concerns with your doctor, you know, and maybe your pharmacist. Go talk to your pharmacist about the concerns you have too. Google it, go to drugs.com, look at what that has to say, et cetera. I mean, there's, there is a place for hydroxychloroquine. There is an absolute place for it that's been massively distorted by COVID, but it does have valid uses. Denise, thank you. Uh, Denise says, thank you, Jill. You've helped me understand this disease very well. You answer all the questions in my head. <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny that people call and say, well, do you have IC? And it's like, uh, yeah. Uh, why else would I be doing this? Because I couldn't do anything, guys. My IC, you know, my bladder pain. I went from being normal to uh, to barely functional in a day. As scary as hell. And and my pain was so severe that I would cry driving and hitting hitting the speed bumps. I would literally almost scream in my car. The speed bumps were so bad. <sighs> and you know, I mean, I had a doctor say to me after after a year of suffering, you know, now I lost my job because my employer terminated patients out on disability. I've been out on disability for a month uh, to have some tests and to have surgery. I got fired. 
So I had a doctor just say to me, you know, you will always be in pain. This is your life. Get used to it. You know, you will you will forever be a burden on your family. That is exactly what he said. I went, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Number one, I still have my brain. I still have my hands. I still have my intelligence. I still have my heart. I still have my soul. I see it's below the waist. Keep it there for God's sake. At least back then before we understood about the, the central sensitization. I said, I will prove you wrong, you son of a bitch. How dare you say that to me? And that was the moment I started fighting. I went home and I started reading. And I have done that every day for 28 years. And that's why I'm a support group leader. But I'm just like you. I, I'm just, I, it's just, I'm stubborn as hell and I wanted to get better. You know? What would I be doing if I didn't do this? I don't know. It's like I was, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Except I love color. I love art. I'd probably be painting and writing, writing novels. And if I were still in sciences, I'd be doing uh, biome research. Marlia says, my glucosamine chondroitin says it's derived from the shells of shrimp, crab, and crawfish. Um, and I'll, uh, also, I see 10 milligrams of vitamin C. This sounds like it may not be a good idea to start. Yes, you're right. That is not a good idea because of the vitamin C. And you're not being a crybaby, hun. we We've all been there. You're just learning. Carol says, what's the name of the app? It's called Bladder Tracker. Elaine says, I took Clonopin today for anxiety. That could also help my bladder and pelvic floor. Well, anytime we can reduce your anxiety level, that's going to relax your muscles, which is going to help your pelvic floor. And it will help your brain understand that, that you know, uh, your, your pain isn't so intense that your brain needs to go into fight or flight. But, you know, uh, you know there's something called cause and effect. There are, there are treatments out there that might reduce the symptoms, but we don't want you to just be dealing with the symptoms for the rest of, the, of your life. We want to try to understand what's causing your symptoms, you know, and that's what's hard for patients who, are, who use pain meds is, you know, I mean, the issues around pain meds are so, so challenging already. And I chaired our state pain conference years ago that led to our governor at the time signing our pain patients bill of rights. So I've been intricately involved with all the issues around in pain care. I understand that you would need help with pain. I do because I needed help with pain. Believe me, I used opiates when my pain was really bad and I still have uh, opiates in my bedroom if I need it. Not many. I save them. But, you know, once you've lived with that pain, you never want to be there again. Um, so I was working with a patient uh, last week who, whose doctor was finally cutting her off. You know, no more pain meds. And she'd been using them for 25 years. And it's like, all right, so what's causing your pain? She goes, I see. And I went, well, what's that? She goes, well, I see. And I went, well, what's that? What specifically is causing your pain? And she's like, oh, I don't know. And we went through the subtypes. Is your bladder well healthy? And the answer is, yeah. They looked at her bladder, perfectly normal bladder. Okay, so we know your bladder wall is not causing your pain. How about your pelvic floor? She goes, what? What's pelvic floor? And I went, well, we now know that if you have really tight muscles, you enter ischemia and that can cause terrible pain. So she goes, I never heard that. And I went, well, we've only been doing it for about the last 10 years. She goes, oh, well, I stopped paying attention to icy stuff 20 years ago. All right, so can you start your stream right away? She goes, no, I have to push to get my urine out. Oh, well, there you go. All right, you realize that's not normal. She goes, no, that's not normal. I went, no, it's absolutely not normal to strain really hard to pee. Do you have pain that goes shoots down your leg? She goes, yeah, how do you know that? Oh, well, that's a, I said, well, that's a de facto diagnosis a pelvic floor dysfunction. She goes, well, they said it was sciatica. And I went, you're right. That's sciatica. That's because your sciatic nerve is being compressed by very tight pier piriformis muscles. Oh. So we go through the subtyping and she's very clearly subtype three pelvic floor driven. No doubt about it. Her bladder's healthy. Her doctors kept saying over and over and over again, 
Your bladder is healthy. There's nothing wrong with your bladder. It's your pelvic floor. And she'd been taking opiates for 20 years. And it's like, all right. So we have to understand cause and effect. You're going to be cut off your pain meds. I understand that. I know how scared you are. But here's the exciting news is we can treat pelvic floor muscles. And these patients are considered curable. So wouldn't it be great if you didn't need the pain meds in the first place? If we actually worked on the underlying cause of the pain, which is, in fact, extremely tight pelvic floor muscles. She's like, yeah, you know, my doctor did say I should have pelvic floor th therapy, but um, I didn't do it because I didn't understand it. And I was like, well, wait, wait, they told you you have tight muscles. They referred you to pelvic floor physical therapy and you didn't go. She went, no, I didn't understand it. She understands it now. She understands it now. So you have to understand cause and effect, cause and effect. Okay. Here, Marlia, let me. Uh... So again, it's a new app. It's got bugs. We appreciate your patience, but you know, to build a perfect app would have been $100,000. And I'm sorry, but nobody has that money. Um, I will um, send that to the, I just took a screenshot of what you just wrote and I'll send that to, to the developer. All right. And I will have them look at it. Okay. Okay. So normally we would be going into a zoom meeting. Um, and so why don't I, so the zoom meeting allows you to come in and talk to me directly. We leave Facebook on, we leave YouTube on, um, Let's see here. Hold on a sec. So let me go ahead and start up Zoom and let's just see if anybody wants to do it. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. It's not a problem at all. I'm going to have to do my prep for the red flag alert tonight anyway. Um, here's the warning right now. Look at that. Got a warning at 1241. The National Weather Service in San Francisco has issued a red flag warning for dry offshore winds which is in effect from 11 p.m. this evening to 8 p.m. Uh, Monday. Winds northeast 10 to 20 miles an hour with gusts up to 40 miles an hour with gusts up to 50 miles per hour at the highest peaks. Any fire, any fire starts would likely see rapid spread due to dry fuels, low humidity, gusty winds in the area. Great. All right, so let me start Zoom here. So normally we do Zoom and then I just pop back into Facebook and YouTube once Zoom is over and see if you have any uh, other questions. So the way you get to the Zoom meeting is you go over to our website, icnetwork.org, click on the support pull down menu, click on stream support group meetings. And there's a link right there for Zoom. So I have now, I am the host. Why are you telling me waiting for the host to start the meeting? Oh, the joys of technology. I am the host. Why are you doing that? Oh, because I'm not signed in. Oh, that's right. I updated software here. Oh. Let's see if I can easily remember my password. No, I must go to the I must go to the binder of passwords. All right, let me try this another way. 
I'm not going to keep you all waiting if I if I can't, you know, this happens every time I reboot my computers. Let's see if this computer has the password saved. Select all images with taxis. One, two, three. Well, I'm logged in, but sorry. Let's see if, if this doesn't work. Uh, you, I'll just we'll just skip it for today. And I'll, okay, great. Now we have it started on the wrong computer without. Recording in progress. Okay, you heard it say recording in progress, but um, you're also going to hear me say recording stopped. We don't record these. All right. Okay. This is not good. How am I going to do this? Oh my God. I can't do it on this computer. I cannot do that on that computer. Hold on. So I've got that turned off. You know what? We're going to skip zoom today. I got to get it on the right computer and it's just not working. I mean, it's going to take me a couple of minutes to do that. And frankly, I don't have the patience to do that right now. I'm sorry. I do not. All righty. So as always, you know, if you all want a little bit extra time, you're certainly welcome to call me at the IC Network offices. I am available on Tuesdays through Fridays, usually after noon Pacific time to take questions. Uh, I do um, um, first come, first serve. And so if you try to call me at our direct line is one, well, my toll free line is 1-800-928-7496 and just go to the patient support line uh, extension. And uh, that's, I answer that phone. Usually if you get my service, that means I'm already working with somebody and just leave your name and number and I'll call you back when I can. Please know that I call back late that I could, because I'm in California. I'm still working at five or six o'clock my time, nine o'clock your time. I might call you back at nine o'clock if you're on the East coast, because it's really, really busy. Thank you, Jadronka, for putting my email address in there. Uh, Gwen says, how would I start a support group, uh, an IC support group in Arizona? Uh, there already is a support group. I think they still have a support group in the Phoenix area, Phoenix Scottsdale area. Uh, the support group in Tucson was run by Michaeline Franklin, who is a good friend of mine. Unfortunately, she uh, passed away in a um, plane crash. Um, she was the longest serving IC support group leader in the country before me. Uh, and and tragically, she and her husband were flying up into Sedona, and, and when they were trying to land, they missed the runway, and they hit a cliff, and they perished immediately. It was a tremendous loss for the icy world. Um, over on our website um, uh, at icnetwork.org, um, there is a support center, and in their support center is there's a group, there's a whole thing in there that's a support group leader area that goes through how to start a support group. What we expect, you know, the normal expectations, you know, the thing about a support group is that you have to be neutral, 
that when you're running an in-person support group, other than what I'm doing right now, which is more of a lecture rather than a support group meeting, um, uh, being a support group leader is not about biases. You cannot bring a bias into a support group meeting. My worst fear as an in-person support group leader is turning somebody away from the one therapy that could help them. And so your job is to be neutral and to be objective and to talk about options and pros and cons. Um, and so I'm more than willing to talk with anybody about being a support group leader. Uh, they're fairly short term. It's my, my in-person support group lasted a decade, 10 years before we switched to all online. And um, uh, most support groups will only survive two or three years if you're lucky because a support group leader gets burned out. Um, it's very, very easy to get burned out with this. You got to really love it. I love it. So that's why I've lasted so long. Ooh, Heggy, thank you for the 200 stars. She says she loves the app. Yes, but it's not perfect. It's not perfect, guys. There are bugs. So please let me know what the bugs are. icnetwork at mac.com. All right, well, listen, we've been doing this now for about two hours, two hours and 10 minutes. So let's do a last call for questions. Last call for questions. Anybody have any more questions? Otherwise, I get to uh, rest for the rest of the day. All right, where is, oh, there they are. How are you feeling otherwise? I mean, God, I've been talking a lot. How are you? How are you? How are you today? That's a difference about an in-person in meeting versus an online meeting. The in-person meeting, uh, generally when we do introductions, we ask things like, what's your favorite flare management tip? What's your favorite icy friendly food? Uh, we have a list of support groups, Gwen, on our website, the ones that we, we know of. The ICA maintains a list, too. Our lists are pretty similar, but there are some groups that are affiliated with the ICA while some are affiliated with the IC Network. So just check both. Check the ICA list and the IC Network list. Uh, is all acid potassium is bad, like stearic acid? No, no, like hyaluronic acid is not bad. Hyaluronic acid, also known as sodium hyaluronate, it's actually a bladder coating. Um, so you're dealing with a flare with MS and IC with lots of vertigo. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. Um, I used to get little mini, I would have when I was going through menopause, I would have a wave of nausea, a wave of vertigo, and then a mini burst where I would feel hot for a minute and then it would go away. But I, I would have like 20 or 30 of those a day, those little waves of nausea and vertigo. I, I feel your pain. Remember with acid, guys, it's about the quantity of acid. So let's consider the difference between a cup of tomato sauce, a cup of tomato sauce is maybe a dozen tomatoes or more that have boi been boiled down. So that's the acid of a dozen tomatoes. There's a lot of acid in tomato sauce. Whereas one small slice of a tomato is gonna have very, very little acid in it. And so the odds are, unless you have Hunter's lesions, you're gonna probably be able to have a little slice of tomato on your sandwich, very, very little acid in there. So it's about quantity. So if you, if you want to try juice, so let's say you've got Hunter's lesions, you want to have try juice. The first juice you would try is going to be a pear juice, uh, preferably orga an organic pear juice, organic apple juice, and dilute it two to one. You know, so a cup of juice with two cups of water. Um, and that's, that's really challenging for some people who are soda drinkers who are used to really, really powerful flavors you know, sweets and, and flavors, um, and even that acidic bite that people like, you know, people with soda who drink sodas like. Uh, the goal here is to do dilutions. 
the less acid, the better. But you're going to be able to do a little bit of acid. So in terms of, let's think about the fruits for a moment. When you think about, for people who are diet sensitive, what are the fruit? What are the fruits that we're going to be careful of? So the fruit you should be able to do is pears, blueberries, and some types of apples, like a gala apple or a Fuji apple. Gala apples and Fuji apples are extremely mild and very low acid. Remember too that as a fruit ripens, the riper it gets, the lower the le level of acid. So you know, you are in, you know, a wonderful time right now because we're in that late summer, early fall harvest fair where you can get a lot of really good fresh fruit. Plus now all the apples are coming into season. Um, and so that's better than something that was picked when it wasn't ripe and is ripening on the, on the, uh, uh, you know, on the grocery, in the grocery stands or on the grocery stand. So again, so gala apple, Fuji apple, honeydew, cantaloupe, blackberries, uh, watermelon. Um, and, you know, we all have slightly different tolerances. Some people have little flares with watermelon, others don't. Some people feel like they can't eat any fruit while others can feel they, they, they can eat almost all the fruits. And that is explainable with your subtype. Patients with hundreds lesions are going to be really diet sensitive. They're the ones who are probably going to stay away from a lot of fruit. But most of them are fine. Bananas, our concern years ago uh, was that the, the potassium level in bananas would be more irritating. But the challenge here is that we've had a lot of research studies now that have under that have explored different foods in the IC patient population. And bananas actually are considered one of the most bladder friendly food fruits. I had a banana this morning. I've never flared from banana, but then again, I'm not Hunter's lesions or bladder well driven. I am pelvic floor driven. So that might be why. Uh, the vegetable aisle is your friend. The great majority of vegetables should be icy friendly. We want you to stay in the outer, the outer walls of the supermarket. It's the processed foods on the aisles that are more of an issue. But a good fresh meat, a good fresh vegetable, fruit, good fresh bread should be okay. <clears throat> Breads bring up something interesting though, because, and it was um, this book. Let me see if I have it. So this book, the Better Bladder book, was built by was written by Wendy Cohen about ten years ago. And she was the first one who talked about gluten intolerance, that there are some, but not all, but there are some patients who when they eat gluten, they tend to get more bladder symptoms. Um, and so, and, and again, she was the first to talk about that. <clears throat> and this is really about trial and error. You just have to try it and see how you do. You know, <coughs> I do better gluten-free. I'm not celiac. Sorry, this is what happens when I talk a lot. Um, I tested negative for celiac. I do not have celiac. What I do have is a gluten sensitivity. When I eat glute, gluten, I get very bloated. Man, I look nine months pregnant. It's ridiculous. So I do not eat regular pasta. I do not eat white bread, uh, only except on very, very rare circumstances. I do better with gluten-free products as a whole. My body feels better and happier. Um, and the bread that I eat, so the bread that I eat is is interesting though, because it's called Ezekiel bread and it's made by a company called food for life. And the cool thing about Ezekiel bread is it's not made with any processed grains. It is made with sprouts and sprouts in general are just much easier to digest and don't provoke the sensitivities that many overly processed grains do. Um, Becky says, do I eat dairy? I, I never drink milk. 
I, if I'm going to do ice cream, in fact, I had regular ice cream about two weeks ago. I had a little scoop two nights in a row. Huge mistake. If I, I instead prefer coconut milk ice cream, I have no problems with coconut milk ice cream at all. I don't do the almond milk. I, I really like the coconut milk products. Um, and, but I do do cheese every now and then. I'm okay with some of the cheeses, but I do not drink milk and I, I do not eat milk, ba milk based yogurt. I mean, cow milk based yogurt. I do coconut milk yogurt, which is great. You know, you've got the live, uh, the live cultures from the coconut milk. I mean, you've got the live cultures that we need for our biome and it, uh, we're not having, dealing with the lactose issues. I've tried lactate and it gives me gas and diarrhea. I don't know why. I, so I just try to stay, I, I try to stay away as much as possible, but we're all human. We all make mistakes. The two foods that I absolutely say no to for me personally is I do not eat oatmeal. If I eat oatmeal, it's like poison in my body. As soon as it hits my stomach, my stomach starts spasming. And then as it goes down into small, my small intestine, spasm, 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 spasm. And then when it eventually, a day later, reaches the large intestine, we are talking, I call them bend over and screamers for me. I can barely walk and I feel it spasming as it's crossing. You know how your, your, uh, your large intestine crosses from the right to the left and then it goes down and then it curves to your rectum, right? And so if I eat oatmeal or chocolate, as soon as it hits here and it's going here, 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 it's spasming, 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 spasming all the way down. And then by the time it gets to, you know, the couple of inches right before my rectum, it is agony. It makes sense. I mean, listen, my family's from the Arctic Circle in Norway. They didn't have oatmeal. My body interprets oatmeal as, as a poison. So the two foods that I do not eat that have made my life massively better is I, I do not eat oatmeal and I do not eat chocolate because chocolate does the same thing. And that also makes sense because chocolate comes from Africa. My family comes from northern Norway and Sweden. There was no chocolate until maybe a thousand years ago. It takes 5,000 years for an evolutionary adaptation to occur. My body simply has never learned how to digest and, pro and properly process chocolate. I can do carob. I cannot do chocolate. Thus solving the mystery, one of the mysteries of why I was so sick every Christmas in my 20s. Because we had a box of seized candy and we ate a piece every night. And I'd be in laying in the fetal position on my bed or on the bathroom floor the next morning from the damn chocolate. Gwen says she can't do oats either. You know, as we get older, you know, and I think that this is kind of an important thing to think about here. Um, you know, when you're a kid and you're going to school and everybody's like, well, you need to find a career. And... And there's a lot of stress and pressure because not everybody knows what they want to do. Most people don't know what they want to do and they're in college and they have to pick a major and oh my God, I don't know what I want to do. <sighs> a career needs to be something that is mentally and intellectually stimulating to you, but it also has to be physically good for you. Also, Gwen, you're Norwegian too. There you go. See, we are truly sisters. Um, so a career isn't just about finding work that your head wants to do. It's about finding work that nourishes your body. What works for your body? Physically, mentally, emotionally. And, and so somebody who has central sensitization, who's super sensitive like me, we do not do well in the city. I worked in the city for a year. I hated it. Work was piece of cake. Could have done the work with my hands tied behind my back. I was miserable. I had stomach cramps. There are too many smells, too many sounds, too much stress, didn't like the car ride. I was miserable. I do better in a quieter environment in the country, which is where I am. So it's about finding a career that nourishes you physically, mentally, and emotionally. Lauren says, can you drink tea? I can't drink tea or eat tomatoes. Thanks. Um, uh, the only tea that I drink is a Rubos tea um, and Dandy Blend. Um, I will tell you, I have had terrible, I had terrible flares from green tea. Holy hell, wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. 
Uh, I used to love chai tea very, very much. Chai, that was my thing, especially after dinner, a cup of chai tea with uh, milk in it and sugar in it was just the perfect way to end of the day. That's how I was right around my, right around the time this began. Can't do that anymore. So what I do instead, this is a Frappuccino I made with Dandy Blend, which is um, a uh, herbal coffee. No acid, no flares, no, oh, it's wonderful. And we have that in our store along with um, our pumpkin spice rubos tea. Here it is, right here. And they've been sold out all summer. Uh, but I'm going to, we're going to try to order it tomorrow. Pumpkin spice rubos tea from Harney and Sons. Um, the cool thing about this is that um, the way I found it is that um, um, the big Barnes and Noble uh, contracts with them every holiday season for holiday teas. And I bought it at a Barnes and Noble like six or seven years ago. It's made with rubos, which is a brown herb, which is pH neutral. And then they put a little bit of, so it's got rubose, natural pumpkin flavor, cinnamon, cloves, and nutmeg, but it's really mild. It's really more vanilla-y than pumpkin-y. So Harney and Sons Pumpkin Spice Herbal Tea. So if you've got a Barnes & Noble, go by their check stand and see if they have any. Uh, and we'll have some more in our store when we get it in. But literally, they haven't sold out all summer, months. Uh, okay, let's see here. Gwen says, she's the best, can't eat sad face. Oh, honey. Gwen says, she lives in the city. She wish she lived out of the city. Yeah, I know. That's like my worst nightmare of being in the city. I just can't stand it. Becky says, I've lived in cities my whole life. I'm so ready for a rural life, but I have to stay my job, stay my job a few more years. Yeah. Gwen said, what is the scope? Uh, you, you said they can see Hunter's lesions. Well, if you have a hydrodistension with cystoscopy in the ER, I mean, in the operating room uh, as an outpatient procedure, they can see that with a regular cystoscope. But there is another type of cystoscope called a narrow band imaging that can be done in the doctor's office. It does not involve stretching your bladder. And that too can identify a Hunter's lesion. So if your doctor has infested your urologist has invested and paid for a narrow band cystoscope, then that's the best case scenario. I worked with a patient last week who had a hydrodistension and biopsy in the doctor's office with no anesthesia. And I was, and she had been in bed for four days, bawling her eyes out. And it's like, what? The doctor did a biopsy and did not give you any anesthesia and didn't give you any pain care afterwards? I mean, that's just cruelty, absolute cruelty. The American Urology Association and their IC guidelines say hydrodistension should be done in the operating room as an outpatient procedure. Why? Because the worst thing you can do to the bladder is stretch it. It will cause pain. And it is normally done as an outpatient procedure with a very mild anesthetic like propofol. And I felt so bad for her that she was literally given a bladder biopsy with no anesthesia and no pain care. I was uh, I, I uh, was appalled and I let her know that I was shocked that that had happened. It should not have happened, in my opinion. Lauren says, thank you so much. Oh, also, uh, Lauren, I didn't say uh, uh, chamomile herbal tea, peppermint herbal tea. Those are important because they are smooth muscle relaxants. So if you're struggling with bladder spasms or bowel spasms, one of the best things you, you can do is peppermint herbal tea or chamomile herbal tea. Peppermint is stronger. If you suffer with GERD or you suffer with stomach sensitivity, belching peppermint sucks. You don't really want to do that. But if you don't have GERD, go with the peppermint. If you do have GERD, go with the chamomile. Smooth muscle relaxants. They actually have the potential of calming your bladder and calming things down. All right. Any more questions? Oh, come on. Come on. I know some of you have a hard question out there. Give it to me. But if you're done, that's okay. I can go do other things. Three o'clock here, six o'clock on the East Coast. I'm good either way. 
I need to go do my pelvic floor work. Right now, what I'm trying to do, because right now my pelvic floor pain is right here. This is exactly where my pain is. It's like literally around my rectum in these levator muscles. And again, it was because of this new, you know, quick thing that I wanted to do, um, exercise protocol. And this had been in it was in strong spasm for a week before I could get it out. And I just went to the pet store, bought some tennis balls. So now I can roll around on a tennis ball to work on that, to work on all the sensitivity right here and right here. Man, you know, this pelvic pain is rough because figuring out where it's coming from is challenging. Uh, Becky says, can you quickly go over the subtypes? Uh, Becky, I did that about an hour ago, but I'll do it very, very quickly. So again, uh, we don't have an agreed upon subtyping system in the U.S., but we do clearly understand that we're not all the same. A one treatment fits all approach does not work. For some people, IC begins after chemical injury to the bladder, while for others, IC can begin after a muscle injury, like having a baby. For some people, genetics are involved. They can inherit this as a child, whereas for others, menopause can play a role. So there's one thing we absolutely do know I, one thing we do know is that one treatment doesn't work for everybody. Why? Because you're not all the same. We're different. And we have a much healthier respect now for the differences in the IC patient population. We call this subtyping. So IC subtype one using the Chris Payne system. IC subtype one, Hunter's lesions. Everybody in the world agrees. Hunter's lesions is its own unique disease. This re represents the most severe form of IC. These patients have bleeding bloody wounds on their bladder. If we biopsy those wounds, they're massively filled with inflammation. There is a warfare going on in that tissue. And now we know one reason why, because we have some research which has suggested that Hunter's lesions are caused by viruses. Some patients may have a viral infection in their bladder causing Hunter's lesions, while others may have an, um, uh, an infl inflammation caused by COVID. COVID-associated cystitis is real. It's real. And let me tell you, listen, my friends, listen, my friends, if you're in Idaho or you're in Texas or you're in Florida or you're in Ohio, in any of those states right now where COVID is out of control, mask up. COVID-associated cystitis is devastating, and it is bringing some patients completely out of remission for their IC. Uh, you've been pain, symptom-free for 20 years. They get COVID bat, and now they've got severe IC that is not responding to any therapy for months. So regardless of what your politics are, understand that COVID can devastate your bladder. It can devastate your urinary tract. And you already know what life is like being in severe pain and having bladder pain. We don't want you to go through it and have something worse than IC, which would be COVID-associated cystitis, okay? So again, uh, and COVID cystitis is again about inflammation. Um, uh, only the severest patients with COVID have active virus in their urine. For the rest of the patients who are getting COVID-associated cystitis, it's all about inflammation. That's a cytokine storm that's driving all the damage that COVID is doing throughout the body and to the lungs. Okay, I see subtype two, bladder wall driven. This means there's a, something else happening with the bladder wall driving their symptoms. Number one, we're going to look at chemical injury, uh, chemotherapy, too much diet soda, et cetera, et cetera, ketamine. We're going to look at estrogen atrophy, the quality and health of your skin. If your symptoms began after surgical menopause or medical menopause, I mean, medication-induced menopause, Lupron, or if you're just older, that your bladder wall is going to change as you get older with the loss of estrogen. And so what's going to happen is that nice, thick, protective coating in your bladder is going to get thinner and it's not going to be able to protect your tissue. Thus, your urine is going to be much more irritating. So the foods you, and drinks you could eat in your 30s, all of a sudden you can't eat in your late 40s or 50s. Not a disease, that's estrogen atrophy. So the quality and health of your skin matters. If your vulva's dry and your vagina's dry, so is your urethra, so is your bladder. And that's a separate and distinct issue. The most important thing you can do is use estrogen, topical estrogen, because when you give that skin estrogen, it immediately starts to repair itself and produce mucus. 
Some of you are given estrogen and you have no freaking clue why. And you take the estrogen and it burns you and you don't use it anymore. Well, the burning is not because the estrogen is chemically burning you. It's because your skin is so freaking dry and it's going to take, you're going to have to ride it out. You're going to have to use the estrogen for a couple of weeks. And as every subsequent time you use the topical estrogen, the skin gets better and better and better. And that burning will eventually go away. It took me like four or five times of using it before it went away for me. But some of you, you stop using it. I don't want to be burned. I'm not going to do that. My sister was one. My sister actually did that at first. Um, she uh, had terrible burning um, and stopped it. And then she finally was like, all right, no, 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 I get it now. I have to continue to use the estrogen to help that skin get healthier and healthier and healthier. Um, so if you wait, 5'10", listen, if you wait until you're 80 to use your estrogen, your vulva it's going to be a wreck. Your skin is going to be really dry and it's going to be really hard to reverse that damage. So little tiny bit of topical estrogen is gold. This is known as the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Also in IC subtype two, we're going to be looking at infection if possible, chronic infection. Some patients do get chronic UTIs, especially older people who are in, who are People with GSM, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, because you lack that nice thick coating of mucus, it's easier to infect your bladder. So therapeutically, not only are they going to be treating your, your infection, they're going to be giving you estrogen to heal that skin. Because until that skin is healed, you're going to be more prone to getting UTI. Some of you could have chronic candida infections. Some of you might have chronic viral infections. That's where the next generation testing is useful. It is useful. It is not perfect. It is hard to interpret, but it will at least tell us if you might have a fungal infection driving your flare. And again, it was our own National Institutes of Health funded MAP Research Network who made the candida connection in some patients. Not all, but some. There's no all for this IC patient population. I see subtype three, pelvic floor driven. These are patients whose symptoms began after a muscle injury or trauma. If you fell on your tailbone, if you um, have one leg longer than the other, if you took a, a, a lot of uh, pelvic floor traumas, um, if you were raped and have a muscle injury, uh, if your symptoms began after riding a motorcycle, I've worked with Ironman athletes, I've worked with professional football players, all with pelvic floor injuries. The great majority of men that I work with have pelvic floor injury. Um, I see subtype four, pudendal neuralgia. These are patients who have a nerve, really primarily a nerve driven issue, but it's a nerve that's being compressed. So if you have pain when you sit down, that is relieved by standing up. If you have pins and needles, if you have sciatica, if you have persistent genital arousal disorder where you feel this arousal sensation, but it's really creepy and uncomfortable and disgusting, and you don't want to tell anybody because you don't want anybody to think you're, you're a creep, you're not a creep. That's what happens when tight muscles squeeze the pudendal nerve. So our therapeutic priority for patients with pudendal neuralgia is to figure out what nerve is being compromised, where it's being compromised, and we want to try to release it. So they're going to be calming nerves down at the same time that they're going to be probably working on relaxing uh, muscles, right? So I have a slight, uh, my pudendal neuralgia, so realize my pelvic floor went to hell after my hysterectomy. It just did. I've been in spasm since for four years now, one way or the other with my hysterectomy. Uh, you know, that's a risk of surgery. And, uh, and I also have a bad SI joint that keeps my muscles tight anyway. So like two years ago, I think it was two years ago, I started feeling this pin pricking along my hair, pubic hairline, like the outside. Like a little prick here, a little prick here, a little prick here. It's like, okay, that's weird. You know that sensation if you ever get a pubic hair stuck in your zipper and you pull on it? That's what it felt like. And then it took about a week for the pin pricking to progress from front to back. And then to go from the hairline to inside where it was like I was randomly being pricked with a needle on my left labia and then my right labia down by my rectum up by front. This really weird pins and needles thing. So I thought it was yeast. I go to urgent care. The guy does the thick, he does the really heavy um, swab to look and see if there's yeast. He thought there was yeast. Gave me yeast medicine, took it for a month, didn't fix it. Stab, 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 stab. 
go to my regular gynecologist. She goes, she goes, I think it's eczema. She puts me on steroids for two months. Didn't work, got worse. Stab, 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 stab. I finally went, you know what? I want to talk to the pelvic pain specialist at Kaiser. She's like, okay. So she, cause she didn't know what to do, what the hell to do with me. And plus she was 20 years younger than me. She had no, very little experience in that. So the pelvic pain, pelvic uh, therapist, I mean, the pelvic uh, pain specialist, the MD, we do a phone consult and she goes, uh, can you wear jeans? No. Can you sit down comfortably? No. She goes, Jill, you have pudendal neuralgia. She goes, I know exactly what you have. You have a compressed nerve right now that's giving your pins and needles. And my answer back was, I always thought the pain from that was more internal. I didn't realize that a compressed nerve could cause pinpricking on the skin on the outside. And she goes, oh, yeah, we see it all the time. And so th what she did is she sent me back to pelvic floor physical therapy. And yes, my muscles were super, super tight. And she gave me a topical estrogen lidocaine, uh, lidocaine jelly to use externally to calm the nerves down in my skin. And it took about six weeks and it went away. And ironically, in this book, Dr. Jerome Weiss is breaking through chronic pelvic pain. He believes that a lot of patients with tight muscles have a variety of, of nerve problems that a lot of people have compressed nerves. And so a big part of his diagnostic workup is evaluating the skin. You know, is there any areas of numbness? Are there any areas of pins and needles? And if he found that, then he always, in addition to working with the muscles, he wanted to make sure that they worked with the nerves. And so that's when we start throwing out the lidocaine jelly that can be put on the skin to numb the nerves. Um, and then he also did lidocaine infusion subcutaneously directly underneath the skin. There can also be nerves that are being compressed. And he, did, he had great success with using lidocaine subcutaneously. Um, so this book, you know, I mean, I think that this book is fabulous. I love it. Julie says, my doctor wanted to do a cystoscope with hydrodistension in the office. I hope you said no. I said, I'll, you'll only do it with anesthesia. What did he, I mean, how did you, how did you do that? Um, and also for anybody watching, please know that we do have our new book, IC101. It's not just a bladder disease. Oh, wait, I have it upside down. <laughs> and this goes into all the subtypes and it goes into a lot of the work of Dr. Weiss. Julie says, I did say no. I've been waiting over two months for one under anesthesia. Good decision, Julie. Very, very good decision. This book is now available on Amazon in the Kindle store. So it is, a, it is available on Kindle, it is available in Amazon, it is available in our store uh, as a PDF file. So Kindle and the PDF file is just $9.99. Cindy says, I went to my physical therapist, she worked in my hip, I came home and my bladder worked. Normally you have to self catheterize. Isn't that Cindy? I mean, girl, isn't that interesting? Lauren says, what do, you, what do you do to ease your flares, inflammation flares? What's your go-to? Um, what is my go-to? Heat. Um, so, my, so my flare protocol is, is really aggressive and I act really, really early. Uh, because I'm, it's like fighting a fire. I want to nip that sucker in the bud. So uh, if I'm in pain for 30 minutes, I stop what I'm doing, grab a heating pad, go sit in my recliner, try to relax my pelvic floor. Um, uh, you know, and a lot of it has to do with kind of trying to recognize what kind of flare it is, right? So my flares right now really are more pelvic floor flares. Or, so there's always a pulling sensation, like there's a hand up my vagina, grabbing on my bits and trying to pull them out of my body. So I know that that's a pelvic floor flare. So what I'm going to do is go get a heat, uh, heating pad, sit in a recliner, uh, just see if I can try to get it to calm down fairly quickly. Um, I might use a muscle relaxant like Flexeril or Baclofen. 
I will almost always uh, get down on the floor and do my stretches or get my glass wand. Um, and you know, um, so obviously if you're in the, in the middle of a wicked flare, you can't necessarily wait for your physical therapist to be there to help you. You might not be able to get into the physical therapist for a month, but hello, your muscles are so tight, you're in agony. So what do you do? Hopefully the physical therapist has already taught you how to use a wand. If they haven't, you need to ask them. So let's look. So let's look at this for a moment. So again, here's your pelvic floor. You cannot reach these muscles. You cannot reach these muscles from the outside to any great degree. The best way to reach these muscles is through your vagina and your rectum, right? And you can see that, well, I have, I have pretty long fingers. I can, I could potentially reach pretty far up here, right? Um, but this is where this helps. So what I do is I lay on my bed, uh, use a little KY and I put, I actually put my feet up on the wall. Um, and I will use this and I will just try to follow the muscle length, right? Yeah. There's a couple of things they can do. They can, you can use it to follow the length of the muscle or sometimes they ask you to go across the muscle like this. Sometimes that helps get it out of spasm. Or they might have you push it on a trigger point. Uh, I found the trigger point work to be pretty painful. I get trigger points right here. Um, so anyway, and, and to me, it's so interesting how your muscles change on a daily basis. I, it's fascinating to me that... Um, when it, when this all first started, most of my pain was on my left side and I had left side sciatica and it was my left SI joint that was messed up. But now my left side muscles are good, but now my right side is really messed up. These muscles are, have lifted. They're like jerky. And, and so now so I can come in, I can come in and work on my left side, no problem. But with my right side, especially back here by my rectum, I have to go really slow. And, and again, it's with the wand. And, um, you know, I usually do it for five or 10 minutes, not longer than that. I kind of hit that point where I'm like done. Um, you can also, uh, any of the books, um, the books that are the best for learning how to do it are going to be... This book and this book and this book and where is my AC survival guide? All right. So if you really want to, so Dr. Weiss in his book, he doesn't go into the details on, you know, how, how you should work with these muscles on your own. Um, Issa Herrera, Ending Female Pain. Um, is probably the most descriptive. And for men, she has a book, Ending Male Pelvic Pain. And so she talks about how to approach. Look at that. I, I, I opened it right to it. I opened it right to it. You, you pretend that there's a clock. So as you're laying on your back, the top of your body is noon. The bo your rectum down there is six o'clock. And she says, focus your stretching from three to nine o'clock, avoiding... 12 o'clock where the bladder is located, start with a shallow layer, then go to layer two, then go to layer three, press around the clock 30 to 60 seconds or until you feel, feel a release of the muscles and you can feel the muscles release. Um, you can also use your finger potentially. Um, generally I will do, oh, see, look at this, this is, this is cool. I don't know if you can see this. So she's comparing it to the knuckles on your on your finger. So this is the bottom knuckle, the middle knuckle, and then the upper knuckle. Knuckle. 
to try to help you figure out where the muscles are located. And I know it's kind of creepy and it's like, yeah, you don't really want to be putting your finger up there. But, you know, these muscles can be hurt just like any other part of the body. They can be hurt. And when they're hurt, they are a beast to repair, but they are repairable. But it's, unfortunately, the location is challenging. So she talks about strumming. She talks about cross friction. Anyway, so if you want more information on how to do this, uh, we haven't been able to, I don't have any, I don't have the any female pelvic pain in, in my store anymore. We haven't been able to reorder it, but I think they have it on Amazon. Uh, I think I do still have a couple of male pelvic pains in our store. Now the next book that is also um, pretty good is called The Interstitial Cystitis Solution by Nicole Cozian. And this was the first book that I thought, I mean, this came out like three, four years ago. When did this book come out? Copyright 2016, five years ago. And, and, you know, they did a fabulous job with it. I mean, she, they did an absolutely beautiful job with this. So she also goes into, you can see when I get these books, I study them. So I highlight, I don't, if I'm not highlighting, I'm not learning. I have to highlight. Um, so her book and see again, really, really good diagrams. And again, for me, my my spasms right now are like right here and right here. Oh, the rectal pain. Oh, it's ridiculous. I always know if I've got rectal pain that if my pelvic floor muscles are tight. So anyway, I think you would find this book to be particularly helpful too. And then last but not least is um, Amy Stein's book, Heal Pelvic Pain, which is written for men and women also. And she too goes into some, um, offers some very, very good uh, techniques for external massage, self-massaging sore points. Isn't that interesting? I haven't, I haven't picked this up, this book in a while. I need to reread all of them. I have a lot of weakness in my thighs right now, you know, so she's got, she's got a very nice exercise protocol in here. All right. So lots of good references for you. And then in our book, I see 101, uh, we also have Gay Sandler's uh, Gay Sandler was really one of the first to really focus on this. She's uh, my co-author in this book. We, she, we go through her entire pelvic floor re, uh, uh, relaxation protocol. I do that one. 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 Not as often. Happy baby, bicycle, lotus rock, stretch and crawl, glute kicks. Do a lot of glute kicks. <sighs> I'm telling you. I kind of want to go back in time and like go, all right, what the hell was the, what the hell triggered this all for me? And I am now convinced that it was breaking my tailbone in seventh grade because that is when my frequency urgency started. I think for me, aside from being a redhead and being super sensitive anyway, which is just the landscape, I think my pelvic issues all began with me breaking my tailbone. I broke the tip of my tailbone off in seventh grade and I could move it around with my finger for a year. So anyway, all right, guys. Yeah. You, 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 is there anything to rec you recommend for husbands? Uh, number one, we have a, a chapter. The last chapter in this book is actually written by a, by Andrew Sandler, Gay's Husband. And so to give the husband perspective on this, um, understand too, hey, p &E, listen. <sighs> Having a condition which makes sex uncomfortable is really challenging because here you are in the middle of a flare and you're like, do not effing 
come near me right now. Do not even think about it. But, you know, of course, your husband can't read your mind at all. You know, he's just being a normal, a normal gentleman. That's that's part of life for a man. It's a sex drive. Um, and when for the for the feet now, and this can go either way. But for the female who's in the flare and who has been in a flare for a while, you know, you're just like impatient, like don't even think go away. Do not even come in here. I'm not interested. The problem is, is that when you say no, he interprets it, some men interpret that as um, that you don't love them anymore. And, 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 you know, it's very, it's a very visceral response. There's a lot of things going on with, with sex. And so it's really, really important that you say, honey, I love you so much. I would love to have sex with you right now, but my vagina is not going there. But that doesn't mean that we can't find a way to pleasure you. And that, you know, we were, I have to tell you, we were all sitting around the table one day, like 15 years ago. And we said, surely, surely somebody has invented a sex toy that can replace a female vagina. And they have. It's called a fleshlight or a tenga. It looks like a, it looks like a flashlight. You'd have, you have it on your bedside table. Nobody have a clue. It's a sex toy. And, and, and when you lift it up, there's an orifice, your choice of an orifice. It can be whatever you want it to be. And, and the man thrusts into that. And so you can hold that between your legs. You guys can have a lot of fun with that. We, so, so, you know, there might be moments when, yes, your vagina is saying not today, but that doesn't mean that there might not be an opportunity to give the gentleman, uh, you know, a little bit of fun. But now let's look at it the other way. Let's look at it the other way for a moment. What if the wife is he healthy, but it's the man who has a prostate injury or has a bladder injury or a pelvic floor injury? And he wants to have sex, but he knows that the minute he orgasms, he's going to have a knife off his penis. And the last thing he wants to do is to have an orgasm. But the wife is sitting there saying, you don't love me. And it's the same thing. It's like, okay, you know, every couple is tested. This is the ultimate test of a good relationship is how do you talk about it, negotiate it when one person can do it and one person can't do it? Nobody should be forced. And there are some couples where the partner is forced. And that is a tremendous, you know, shame. Nobody should ever be forced. It's about, it tests your maturity. I think that women should have a, or, or the, the partner within, with pain needs to have a safe word. You cannot expect your partner to guess when you're ready, when you'd like to try it. You have to talk about it. Say, you know, hun, I might be a little bit in the mood. You want to try a little bit, but we have to go slow. We're going to see how we do. We have a whole area on our website. Uh, we have a sex and intimacy center on our website that talks a little bit more about that. You're going to have to use a lot of lubrication, maybe try different positions. And, but most of all, you can't expect your partner to guess. You have to be specific. What hurts and what doesn't hurt? And, you know, it's very easy to lose trust in your body. It's very easy to lose your confidence and to think that everything's going to hurt. And But the reality is, is when we start working with these pelvic floor muscles and we get these pelvic floor muscles healthy, it might not hurt so much. But you have to kind of figure that out on your own before you involve your partner. And you know what I'm talking about. You might need to, you just got to try stuff. See if you can feel it. And that's, you know, see what feels good. But do not expect your partner to read your mind. Now, I want to share the story of um, Joanna Chuck. They were members of my group. They had both passed away. Um, uh, Joanne, um, I loved her. She was sweetie pie. She had uh, Lewy body dementia, which is what took her life, which is really sad. 
they came to our support group Christmas party and they had been fighting. And so here at our Christmas party, you know, we're just, everybody's brought, brought icy friendly food. There were about 20 of us there, you know, just a fun little gathering. And they walked in and they were spitting fire. They were just spitting fire at each other. And, and it's like, you know, and I was a support group leader. And it's like, all right, guys, what's going on? And she, she yells at him. He doesn't even love me. He won't even hug me anymore. Why should I stay with him? He doesn't love me. He won't even give me a hug. And you look at Chuck. He's stricken. He goes, when I try to hug you, you push me away. Believe me, I want to hug you. I want to show you affection, but you push me away almost every time. And they were as far apart as they could have possibly been. And here you've got the woman who's suffering, who's just desperate for a hug. And she doesn't understand that she has said no to him so many times, or ow, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's afraid to try. He loves her, but he's afraid to try. And then you've got Chuck, who's like, oh my God, I don't want to hurt my lover. I don't want to hurt my wife. So I'm going to stay away. And it was heartbreaking. And so I said to I said to Joanne, I said, honey, have you told him when you're ready to have a hug? And she goes, no, he should know. He should know when I need a hug. And I went, that's not fair. He can't read your mind. All he knows is that you've been in pain. He doesn't know when you're feeling better. You have to tell him, honey, I could really use a hug right now. And he will come and give you a hug. And she was really the, um, she, she, she really was a dysfunctional person in the relationship, you know, because she expected him to read her mind and, and he couldn't read her mind. And so guys, you gotta, you gotta elevate it here a little bit. It's about talking to each other. Remember when you're young, intimacy is very quick. It's slam, bam. Thank you, ma'am. You're done in five minutes. But what happens as couples get older is that intimacy changes. It becomes more intimate in a way. It's less about the slam bam, thank you, ma'am. And it's more about the cuddling and the hugging and the and all that sort of good stuff. And so when you're young, it's very athletic. When you're in your 70s, it's not athletic. It's about touching, stroking, hugging. And we are all in a journey as we get older, as we adapt. And it's all about the good communication that keeps couples together. And being honest and being willing to try and respecting no and respecting the fact that, okay, no, 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 that that's a little uncomfortable. Let's try something else. Don't, don't bear it. Try something else. It's okay. So again, we have this great uh, sex center on our website, icnetwork.org. And then there's another book that Dr. Eckenberg wrote. Where is it? Here it is. Secret suffering, secret suffering, and it's how women's sexual and pelvic pain affects their relationships. And um, this just got a, gr a lot of great ideas in here, a lot of great tips and, you know, how to make things more comfortable, et cetera, et cetera. God, I just want to reread all these books. I just don't have time. So look at that. So good. So freaking good. All right. And I'm working with Dr. Eckenberg regularly at this point in time. So if you, if, if sex is a real issue for you, here you go. Secret suffering. You can get it on Amazon. All righty, my friends. Not a, you know, I'm about pretty willing to talk about anything. I try not to offend anybody, but we got to be real. So let's see here. So Gwen, that sharp knife sensation, that's a levator, that's a spasm, right? That's a nerve spasm.
Uh, Rhonda says, yep, that's what happened to me. And my partner was afraid to have intimacy with me and we parted. You know, and the thing is, is, you know, I think one of the saddest cases, one of the absolute saddest cases, I had a gentleman call me who was a, uh, he was like the mayor of a town somewhere in the Caribbean, on one of the Caribbean islands. And he uh, was just very, very upset because his wife had left him. And he'd gotten this diagnosis of IC. He didn't understand it. Nobody had really explained it to him. And, and he, he was devastated by the fact that his healthy wife left him. And uh, she said as she was going out the door, you can't keep me in the lifestyle I deserve. I'm out. Because he hadn't been able to work for a couple of months. And I thought, how disgraceful that is, how absolutely disgraceful that is, that we're supposed to be supporting each other as, as anybody deals with any sort of injury or stuff like that. And so, you know, I said, I'm so sorry. You know, there's this perception that it's men who leave women. Let me tell you, women leave men all the time. And some of those women are damn cruel. And he was just going, who would want me? Who would want me with this? And I shocked him and I said, I would. Are you kidding? You're the perfect date for me. I'd love to go out with you. And it shocked him. <laughs> I said, listen, everybody has, you know, as, as we all get older, we're all going to have stuff. It's okay. It's okay. And uh, I still think the perfect, the perfect husband for me is, a, is another husband with a pelvic injury. Anybody out there? I'm getting a little tired of waiting and being alone. I got to tell you, it's shocking. I can't believe I, I've been single all this time. I almost got married a couple of times, but in the end, it wasn't, wasn't going to work. Health is real. All right, my friends. Well, listen, I wish you well. Y'all have a good week. Hopefully, we'll be back maybe on Thursday to do a Facebook only uh, support group meeting. Um, although you never know, um, now that my schedule is getting a little bit better, we finished the book. I'm working on IC 101 Flare Guide, IC 101 Diet Guide. I'm uh, going to do an IC 101 case study series of patient stories. Um, the app is done, but now we're going to be troubleshooting the app. So things are busy uh, with fire season. So send us all your good prayers that we get through the next 24 hours and the next couple of months. All right. All right, everybody. Peace and love to you all. Be bold and mighty forces shall come to thy aid. Be strong, be confident. Look at every day as a new opportunity. Okay. And if y'all need, you need to get a hold of me, you know how to do that right through the website. All right, guys, I'll see you later. Plus I got to get out of this chair because my muscles are starting to spasm. All right, Facebook. Goodbye, Facebook. All right, YouTube. Y'all be well. I'll see you later.